All right, welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. We are here at Hilltop Restaurant over at Foster in California. In Chicago. In Chicago every Saturday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., okay? And the way this, the way it works over here is we have a um, uh, uh, announcements, and after announcements we have uh, uh, the, the guest speaker. The guest speaker speaks for a little bit. And then we have Brown be the uh, question moderator. If anybody has a question, Brown will make sure he get, uh, points out who gets the next question. And after the question period, then we have rebuttal period. And please keep in mind that during rebuttal period, you only have five minutes. If anybody has trouble keeping those five minutes, I have some duct tape for you to help out with the, uh, if you go beyond five minutes, okay? You get the hook. You get the hook. You get the hook. All right, so, so tonight we're going to have a, a speaker by the name of Don. He's going to talk about neoconservatives. Don, are you, are you ready to come up, Don? Nice round of applause. There we go. Well, tonight we have Don Ritchie, who has been missing several uh, meetings, but he is back, and he will enlighten us about the neocons. Yeah, all right. Okay. That's your subject, the rise and fall. All right. Let's welcome our speaker, Don Ritchie. Don Ritchie. Hey. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I guess the first question. I was sitting over here at the table. And I was talking to Steve, and he was asking, well, "What is a neoconservative?" And I'll I'll explain that very briefly. Uh, uh, first of all, the the neoconservative movement is a it's a branch of the larger conservative movement in the in the U.S. One of the um, neoconservatives are primarily academics, and intellectuals who write on conservative issues and try to influence the Republicans in Washington, and uh, and and to some extent they also try to influence the more centrist Democrats. Uh, now, as with like the libertarians, uh, neoconservatives uh, generally oppose high taxes, and support free trade, and sometimes free immigration. But uh, they don't support laissez-faire economics as much as libertarians do. Um, they're generally in favor of capitalism, but they don't go quite as far with, with it as the libertarians. Now, neo now, one thing that does distinguish the neoconservatives, which the area which they're almost unique, is that they advocate an aggressive uh, interventionist foreign policy. Actually, there isn't any other group in political group in the United States that advocates a more aggressive foreign policy than the libertarian than the neoconservatives. Uh, they generally believe that the United States should never negotiate with its enemies. And actually, after doing some research, and I knew this before I started the project, but after doing research, I came to realize that the neoconservatives also do not believe in negotiating with our friends either. <laughs> now, let me explain. The, if you think back to the Allies during World War II, you had three big allies. You, you had the United States, the, the British Empire, and the Soviet Union, and and they would sit down and have these have these meetings like 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 Yalta and Potsdam, and they'd work things out. And there was it was a negotiation between equals. Well, the the neoconservatives do not believe that in, at the at present time that the United States should engage in any of this stuff. What we should do instead with our allies is simply tell them what we're going to do, and and insist that they go along with it. And if they don't, they'll be punished. In other words, the same way we deal with our enemies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so like union. Yeah, uh, well, now that's that's a that's a whole different topic. Uh, so um, now, very frequently, of course, the neoconservatives have often criticized Democrats and sometimes even Republicans for being too timid in their foreign policy. Um, uh, one, uh, in particular, the neoconservatives uh, believe in unconditional support for Israel. Um, uh, if anything, uh, sometimes, like for example, if a labor government is in power in Israel, they may feel that Israel is not being aggressive enough. But that's another matter. Uh, um, now, neoconservatives uh, tend to be former liberals or even socialists who, who became disillusioned with high taxes, and social welfare programs, affirmative action, and detente. But they retain a liberal belief in, in social tolerance. Um, as a result, uh, neoconservatives have included people who would be unwelcome in other conservative movements. Um, I mentioned, of course, uh, many neoconservatives are Jewish. Um, Jews would not be welcome in the religious right, uh, which is pretty much a Christ Christians only. 
but he also would not be welcome among the paleo-conservatives, who are the conservative counterpart to the neoconservatives. Um, there also there have been there have been uh, gay men in the neoconservative movement. Neoconservatives are not against they're not against gay rights. Um, uh, Andrew Sullivan, for example, used to be a neoconservative. Uh, and so did uh, David Brock. Uh, there have been, uh, been Muslim Americans in the neoconservatives, like, uh, like Fuad Ajami, who just died recently, um, and uh, Asians like Francis Fukuyama. Uh, now, many neoconservatives, sometimes it's hard to identify who is a neoconservative and who isn't, because many neoconservatives today disavow the label conservative. Uh, they prefer to call themselves moderates, uh, centrists, pragmatists, or even sometimes liberals. Um, now, there are some organizations that are um, that are associated with the neoconservatives: the Project for a New American Century, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and the, um, the American Enterprise Institute. Those are all neoconservative think tanks. Now, and some prominent neoconservatives have included Irving Kristol, Norman Podhoritz, Gene Kirkpatrick, uh, and um, the neoconservative publications. Um, that of today would include the Commentary magazine and also the Weekly Standard, um, which is published by Irving Kristol's son, William Kristol. Now, I'll just get into the history of the neoconservatives briefly. The neoconservative movement is, is pretty much a development here in the United States in the 20th century. It doesn't really have it doesn't really have any counterpart in other countries of the world, uh, the way, for example, the Democratic Socialists do. Um, although one could argue. That the, that the neoconservative movement actually has antecedents in, in people like Edmund Burke, who, he, if you, some of you may know, Edmund Burke was a member of the British Parliament back in the 18th century. Uh, he was, um, and he was a liberal in the classical sense at that time. I mean, he was a member of the Whig Party, which, was, which became the Liberal Party. Uh, he was uh, an advocate of, uh, early in his career, he was an advocate of democratic government and human rights. But, but after the French Revolution got going, he felt that it was going too far, and he, um, he changed his views, he became more conservative, and he concluded that the, the common people are not ready for self-government. <laughs> and um, that, that idea would have a major influence on neoconservatives in the future. Now, I'll just tell you a little bit about the founding fathers of neoconservatism here in America. There's, uh, one of them, of course, is the two big guys. The, the most famous are, are Irving Kristol and Norman Podhoritz. Now, Irving Kristol was um, an intellectual, lived in New York City. Now, originally, he'd been a Trotskyist. I don't know how much you all know about uh, Trotskyism, but it was uh, an offshoot of the Marxist-Leninists. The Trotskyists, after the death of Lenin um, in Russia, um, there was a split within the communists between those who followed Stalin and those who follow Trotsky. Actually, I should gesture with my left hand for Trotsky, right hand for Stalin, because the, 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 the Stalinists call the Trotskyists left deviationists. Anyway, or that's what they call them in the Stalin era. Anyway, um, anyway, there was a split in, in between the followers of Stalin and the followers of Trotsky. Well, obviously, within the Soviet Union, the Stalinists won. And, but uh, Trotsky you know, carried on, and he went to Mexico, where he eventually was assassinated by a Soviet agent and um, but his but there are various Trotskyist groups still in existence like the social the Socialist Workers Party for example and others uh, here and there um, now th this is very significant this uh, business of Trotskyism because because see that the Trotskyists believed in revolutionary they believe in revolutionary socialism but they reject the crimes of Stalin and his followers. So, uh, therefore, during the Cold War, if you were a Trotskyist, it was possible to be a Marxist-Leninist while at the same time being strongly anti-Soviet. Okay? I mean, that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it isn't. And I've, I've, I've met Trotskyists. I have, I, I, I've, uh, I have friends who are Trotskyists, and, and they... Uh, they're very much they're very much against capitalism, and they're very much in favor of a revolution right here in the United States. But uh, they they also will freely admit that the Soviets were bad news. And so now, 
Erwin Kristol was, uh, he was against the Soviet Union. His hostility to the Soviet Union led him to advocate a hawkish approach uh, toward communists. Um, Kristol saw international communism as a united conspiracy out to take over the world, uh, one which must be opposed by any means necessary. Uh, Crystal opposed detente and advocated intensifying the arms race. He also supported U.S. participation in the Vietnam War. Now, his support for our role in Vietnam led to his becoming opposed to the new left when it um, started to get into the headlines in the 1960s. See, since the, the, the new left was, those were the younger generation of leftists, and since they they opposed U.S. involvement in the war, so Crystal concluded that they were either unwitting dupes of the Soviets, or else they were willing stooges. And um, Crystal also opposed the New Left for its embrace of what neoconservatives called identity politics, black power, women's rights, gay rights, etc. Irving Crystal never believed in any of that. Um, now another prominent person who had a big influence, who was considered one of the founding fathers of neoconservatism was a man named Norman Pod Horitz. He also, um, he was the editor of a political magazine called Commentary, which I mentioned already. Now, like Irving Crystal, Norman Pod Horitz was, uh, was Jewish. He was, uh, he was from New York City, and he originally was politically kind of left of center. Uh, but unlike Chris, Crystal, Pod Horitz was never a Marxist. Uh, and, and he was actually a, a liberal Democrat. He was a he, had, he was an admirer of John F. Kennedy. Um, now, one of the things you need to understand is that liberal Democrats in the early 1960s in the Kennedy era were very different from liberal Democrats today. Uh, first of all, they were just as strongly opposed to communism as the Republicans, um, both at both abroad and here at home, uh, and. And they also, there was, um, there was virtually no difference between the Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy at that time. And another, on domestic issues, uh, liberal Democrats did not advocate the legalization of abortion. It wasn't even a big issue in the early 60s. It was, it was illegal almost everywhere. Uh, they did not, liberal Democrats did not campaign for gay rights. They did not yet advocate Medicare or Medicaid. That, that would happen later. There was the Democratic Socialists were campaigning for that, but but not not the Democratic Party, and um, and a lot of liberal Democrats were very ambivalent about civil rights. Um, now, as for Kennedy himself, when when John Kennedy was president, he lowered taxes for the rich. He tried to overthrow the Castro government in Cuba. He initiated the aerial bombing of South Vietnam. And he refused to support the civil rights movement until he was pressured to do so. Okay, so, and, and he was considered a liberal Democrat in his time. I mean, those, those all sound like things a neoconservative would do now. But uh, anyway, now Norman, Norman Pod Horitz liked Kennedy, fine. He just didn't have a problem with any of this. But as, as the 1960s progressed, Pod Horitz soured on many of the developments that he saw happening in the 60s. Um, like Crystal, he opposed what he considered identity politics. Uh, he also opposed the anti-Vietnam War movement. He, in fact, uh, Pod Horitz remained pro-war, uh, pro-Vietnam War, even after the Democratic Party as a whole had become anti-war. Um, and, of course, needless to say, Pod Horitz also opposed detente with the Soviets. Um, now, neoconservatism tends to run in the family, right, so to speak. For example, Irving Crystal's wife, Gertrude Himmelfarb, has become a prominent neoconservative in her own right, as has her son, William Crystal. And as for Norman Pod Horitz, uh, his wife, Midge Dechter, and their son, John Pod Horitz, uh, have also become prominent in the movement. Uh, now, now, in 1965, a document was published that would have a major impact on neoconservative thinking with regard to domestic policies. Uh, the Moynihan Report by Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And I, let's see, it was called something. I had a more complicated official title, but I don't remember it. Most of you, a lot of you have probably heard of it. It was written by Assistant Secretary of Labor Daniel Patrick Moynihan. The document focused on the problems of Negroes in America. That was the term they used, Negroes, and that's the language of that time. Uh, according to the Moynihan Report, 
Uh, the problems black people faced in the U.S. were caused not by racism or segregation, but by themselves, particularly the higher rate of childbirth out of wedlock than white people. According to Moynihan, this led to he called what he called a tangle of pathology that, in, in Moynihan's view, kept blacks in poverty. Now, he wrote this report in 1964, at a time when the 1964 Civil Rights Act bill was just being passed. Uh, the Voting Rights Act still lay in the future. It hasn't happened yet. That would happen in 1965. The public schools, most public schools were still segregated. In, in, in the South, they were, and most of them were still segregated by law. They hadn't, uh, they, they, they wouldn't, most of them at the time, they wouldn't integrate unless they were forced to by court order. Um, and by the way, most of the suburbs were also segregated throughout the country, not so much by law, but by custom or by, uh, by mutual agreement. Um, and, but in, in this report, that's, this, that's what things were like in 1964 and 65. But in this report, Moynihan <laughs> acted as if, he, he wrote as if none of this existed, as if that racism was already something from the distant past. Okay. So Moynihan went on to work for the Nixon administration, where he advocated a policy of, quote, benign neglect, end quote, with regard to black people's problems. Um, now, the effect of the Moynihan report on the neoconservatives, and actually on a lot of liberals at the time, was to conclude that it was black people's own fault that so many of them were poor, and therefore there was nothing to be done about it. If welfare programs were to exist, they should be conditional so that only the truly deserving benefit from them, in this way of thinking. Now, another guy who had a big influence on the neoconservative movement was a uh, was a, a senator from Washington, a Democratic senator, and it named Henry Jackson, um, though known often as Scoop Jackson. Now, um, now he was a Democrat. He was a liberal on social issues, but at the same time, uh, he was advocated a very hawkish foreign policy. Uh, for example, opposing detente with the Soviets. Now, on that issue, Jackson was not only quote to the to the right of most Democrats, he was even to the right of President Richard Nixon. <laughs> now, now, at that time, Boeing had its headquarters in Washington State, in Seattle. And so it always went around that, that, that Senator Jackson was being influenced by Boeing. I, I wanted to do more research on that, uh, and I didn't have time to. I read the allegations, but I, I did not have enough time to find the smoking gun or to find out whether there is one or not. Um, and, but in any case, he was often humorously referred to as the senator from Boeing. Of course, if you may know that Boeing uh, builds the B-52 bombers, so they obviously, if the United States maintains a very militaristic foreign policy, then companies like Boeing and other weapons makers will make more money, uh, military contractors. Um, now, Senator Henry Jackson's staff included many people who would later become prominent neoconservatives, like Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Frank Gaffney, and, uh, and others. Uh, now, another person who had a big influence on neoconservative things, she was one of the first neoconservatives, too, was a woman named Dean Kirkpatrick. Now, she helped organize a group in 1972 called the Coalition for a Democratic Majority. I don't know how many of you have heard of that group, but in any case, the, okay, one hand goes up. Um, the, uh, in 19, you know, one of the things you have to understand is in 1972, the anti-war forces finally gained control of the Democratic Party, or what actually happened is that George McGovern, the anti-war Democratic candidate for president, ended up becoming the nominee. And and so with that, the the Democrats who were still pro-war at this stage, people like Henry Jackson and Gene Kirkpatrick, felt like, well, the anti-war forces have taken over the Democratic Party. And so with her coalition for a Democratic majority, she advocated that the Democrats uh, need to continue to support the, the Vietnam War. And 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 should not be anti-war because her argument was if they if the democrats oppose the vietnam war they're not going to you know they're going to lose the elections and they did because of course nixon won in a landslide 
winning every state except Massachusetts. And so afterward, she, Jean Kirkpatrick, who had been a Democrat, she, was in, she wanted to help the Democratic Party. She became much more critical of the Democrats after that. Uh, Jimmy Carter became president, but she continued to criticize him for, for being too soft on communism, in her view. And she wrote an essay which is very influential, which in which, and I forget the title of it, but but the essay in the essay she made a distinction. She she, she argued that uh, that we need to, as usual, we need to do everything we can to fight communism, and she made a distinction between authoritarian regimes and totalitarian regimes. Now, by totalitarian regime, she basically meant communist, although it would have included the Nazis when they were still around, but they were gone, so it's basically just the communists. And. And, and by authoritarian regime, she meant dictatorships that are not communist. So in her view, an authoritarian regime, no matter how repressive, is still not as bad as, as a communist government. Um, because, because whereas the authoritarian regime is just a dictatorship, in her view, the, the totalitarian regime, the communist state, tries to control everything, every aspect of people's lives, and is therefore, uh, by definition, far more repressive than an authoritarian regime. Um, she also uh, argued that, in, in her view, since also since the authoritarians typically maintain status quo, they don't try to change things, whereas the communist government, when it takes over, tries to change everything. So her in her view, trying to change everything also auto would automatically lead to more repression than maintaining status quo. And so, so she advocated that as a matter of policy that the United States should support authoritarian regimes if the only alternative appears to be a communist government, a, a totalitarian regime. As a matter of fact, she advocated supporting authoritarian regimes, even if there's a, uh, if they're pro-American, even if there's a movement that wants to overthrow them and make the country democratic. Because her argument was that it takes centuries for people to develop the habits and the maturity to to be responsible citizens and participate in the government. Most people don't have that, and 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 therefore, therefore, most of the world is not ready for democracy. Uh, now, another guy that had a big influence on the, on the, um, the neoconservatives was a man named Leo Strauss, although I do not consider him to have been a neoconservative. A lot of people do call him one. Um, and actually, uh, I was on the way over here, and I was, uh, I was having an argument with uh, Brad Little about this. Not really an argument, more of a discussion. But one, Leo Strauss was a professor at the University of Chicago. And he was a fairly conservative man. Um, he was actually um, like, actually like Norman Podhoritz and Irving Kristol. He was also That's Jewish. Okay. He was from, he was actually from Germany and had escaped uh, from Germany after the Nazis took over, and then came to the United States and and uh, became a professor at the University of Chicago. And um, and he was an advocate of of a traditional. Of, of the traditional canon in, 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 in teaching about Western civilization, uh, about, uh, he believed in teaching the classics and like ancient Greek uh, philosophy and, and that kind of thing. And he was and he was very strongly influenced by Plato. And one of the ideas that he took from Plato's Republic, uh, which has subsequently influenced neoconservative thought, was the concept of the noble lie, which and. The, the idea is that a ruler of a state who is a just ruler may find that the best policy is to lie to the people. Because uh, if the ruler knows what is in the people's best interest, then he may feel compelled to lie because the people wouldn't under, if he told the truth, the people wouldn't understand it or accept it. So, for the good of the country and for the good of the people, he, he'd have to, he, he would have to lie to them. That's the concept of the noble lie, a lie with good intent. 
And so anyway, the, so the neoconservatives, mostly they were on the outside. They weren't really part of the government. But um, but then when Ronald Reagan became president in, uh, in 1980, um, some neoconservatives did get into government. He, he actually, they actually influenced Reagan's thinking. He was influenced by the neoconservatives. And for, for example, he made Gene Kirkpatrick the uh, um, ambassador to the United Nations. And um, and and uh, and he listened to the neoconservatives, but he also listened to other people too. And he sometimes he took the neoconservatives' advice, and other times he didn't. He didn't follow their advice all the time. For example, um, the, the neoconservatives opposed any negotiation with the Soviets. And obviously Reagan did eventually negotiate with the Soviets after Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union. Now, one other, one other thing I would say is that a lot of the neoconservatives' predictions turned out to not be true. For example, it was the belief of Gene Kirkpatrick and the other neoconservatives that once a country went communist, that was it. It would never go back. That the, the, the government was so repressive that it would be impossible for the people inside that country to oppose it. And, and um, another, it also as it turned out, that their ideas about Soviet strength were exaggerated. Because, of course, the, in fact, the, by, the, by the beginning of the 1980s, the whole Soviet empire was starting to fall apart. And, um, and of course, you know what happened. I mean, eventually, the, um, all the, the Soviet satellite states of Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, East Germany, and the rest of them broke away. And of course, the Soviet Union itself fell, ceased to be communist, and the Soviet Union broke up. And so, so most of... Uh, the neoconservatives had assumed that the Cold War would go on forever, that there wasn't any solution. The Soviets were much too strong for anything like that to ever happen. And in any case, no, no communist government could ever be overthrown. Um, and so the end of the Cold War caused something of an identity crisis for, for neoconservatives. Uh, there was a lot of talk. Um, in the, the, by this time, George H.W. Bush was president. There was a lot of talk. Um, among among the Democrats and even among some Republicans about a, a peace dividend. Oh, oh, the Cold War is over. We don't have to spend all this money on the military now. We can we can we can we can uh, we can cut back on military spending and, and maybe um, and and maybe spend it on domestic things. Well, you, over time, the neoconservatives came to focus on what they considered a new enemy. Uh, and a new, a new theater of conflict, if you will, as the Middle East. Um, and there was, and, and there was some debate about this. But gradually, they, gradually, they began to kind of zero in on, on, on the Middle East as the enemy. It was kind of things were kind of moving in that direction already because you had the revolution in Iran and, and the hostage crisis and these various other things. So they, so they began to, they began to focus on the Middle East as a, as a, as a new threat. And of course, then there was the, the Gulf War, um, which, um, in which um, that was the Gulf War of 1990-91, where, where Iraq, under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, invaded and conquered Kuwait. Of course, then, uh, of course, then pre the president George H. W. Bush, uh, he was uh, president at that time, sent the uh, sent the U.S. military in, and they. Um, and they uh, invaded and recaptured Kuwait and drove the Iraqis out. Now, there was a man, there was one a neoconservative who, at that time who was working for the Bush White House. His name was Paul Wolfowitz. He was actually in the Defense Department. And he felt that we shouldn't have stopped by just liberating Kuwait. We should have, we should have taken out Saddam Hussein. Um, and, and we did. And then... Now you may, some of you may recall, back in 1991, that um, that we also supported the Kurds, who were they were an ethnic group. They're not Arabs, and they were and they're up in the north of Iraq along the Tur Turkish border, and and they were fighting uh, for an independent Kurdistan. Uh, there was also, and I, I did a whole presentation years ago on the on the Iraq War, but there was also the um, 
there were also the Shiite Muslims, because the, the Arab population of, of, of Iraq is divided between Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims, two different sects. Then, well, Saddam Hussein and his and, and, and his associates, they're all Sunnis, and so, and, and they were all Sunnis, there, but they, they, they controlled Iraq, and so the Shiites were kind of shut out. And so there was a rebellion of the Shiites in 1991, uh, in, during, in the aftermath of the Gulf War. Now, Paul Wolfowitz advocated that we go in and we, and we help out the Shiites, give them aid, and eventually, and eventually with the aid of our allies in, in, among the Kurds, and, and, and the Shiites in the south, we would, uh, we would topple Saddam Hussein and, 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 and Iraq would be a free and democratic state. And, uh, well, it didn't happen, of course. Um, the, uh, of course, Bush didn't, didn't go all the way. And, uh, but, but Wolfowitz did not, he, he didn't forget that. And he still, even after, even after the war was over, he was still of the opinion that we should go in there and, and take out Saddam Hussein, conquer Iraq, and take it over. And, um, and so, so Wolfowitz helped organize a group called the Project for a New American Century, started in the 1990s. And it included a lot of prominent neoconservatives. So, uh, William Crystal, the son of Irving Crystal, was a member, um, and a man, uh, an Afghan man named uh, Salme Khalil Zad was also a member, and a man who uh, he would later go on to become the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan. He was of Afghan uh, descent. And also a man named Robert Bruce Zolik, who went on to become our uh, trade representative under the George W. Bush administration. Now, the Project for a New American Century um, basically lobbied Washington and tried to make their case. They didn't talk only about Iraq. They had this vision for, for the whole world, for America's role in the whole world, not just Iraq. Uh, their argument was this. Now, now that the Cold War is over, basically the Soviets have been shoved aside, now we can control the whole world. I mean, they wouldn't phrase it that way. The term the neoconservatives, they don't talk about the U.S. controlling the world. The term they, they, the term they use is global hegemony. But that basically means the U.S. controlling the world. That, that now that we're the only world, the world's only remaining superpower, Russia cannot compare with us, and, and, um, and, and we, we, are the, we are the world's foremost defender of freedom and democracy, and, um, and free enterprise, by the way, since the Wolfowitz and the other neoconservatives at this point saw democracy and free enterprise as being inseparable. That they can't have one without the other, in other words. And so, and so we have a duty to bring freedom and democracy to the rest of the world as much as we can. Th that was the view of the Project for a New American Century. Now, one of their ideas was, first of all, the, what they called a Europe whole and free. In other words, that means Europe should not be divided anymore. Europe should be united. So they were very strongly in favor of the European Union. They were also in favor of, ev of, of getting every country in Europe into NATO, as much as many of them as possible anyway. And they were also in favor of the expansion of NATO eastward, ultimately to include Ukraine. And, and so, so th the other thing, they also were very much in favor of, the, of, of Clinton's war in Yugoslavia, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, because they felt that the United States could bring peace and order to that part of the world. And, and so, and, and as far as Iraq goes, they advocated that the United States uh, in, immediately long, go to war, as soon as possible, with Iraq. It, it, their argument was that if we do not do so, Iraq eventually Saddam Hussein will have nuclear weapons, and then it will no longer be feasible for us to conquer the country. So we should get them now before they get uh, nuclear weapons. Yeah. Now, now they, they basically now at this point, just to give you the reality, just to let you know what was actually going on. At this point, um, the Iraqi government was under a very severe. Uh, weapons inspection regime. You may recall the inspectors were going around uh, looking for uh, inspecting to make sure that Iraq did not have nuclear or biological or chemical weapons in their arsenal. But 
from the neoconservative uh, point of view, since they rejected negotiation and compromise, uh, this was all a complete waste of time. We should just finish with Iraq, go to war, bring the, get the weapons inspectors out of the country, go to war with them now. And they were advocating this when Clinton was president. So, uh, they, they worked to try to win over other movers and shakers in Washington. And they were, had some success in doing this, the Project for a New American Century. One of the people they managed to win over was a man who had been the Secretary of Defense for Gerald Ford, Donald Rumsfeld, and who had not been part of the neoconservative movement, but he was now. And another guy that they managed to win over was the former Secretary of Defense for George Herbert Walker Bush, a man named Richard Cheney, that some of you might have heard of. So, so with these two, and another person, they, they, they got to join the PNAC, uh, was the governor of Florida, Jeb Bush. And so now, when George W. Bush ran for president in 2000, well, after he became president, he made, he made, actually, before he became president, he chose Dick Cheney to be his vice presidential running mate. And then after he became president, he chose Donald Rumsfeld to be a Secretary of Defense. Uh, Rumsfeld then brought in Paul Wolfowitz as an Assistant Secretary of Defense. And now, and so, and, and, and more neoconservatives came in, uh, Louis Libby, uh, uh, John Bolton, um, I'm trying to think of the other name, Douglas Fight, Richard Pearl, yeah, Richard Pearl, who I've met, by the way, I, met, I got to meet him. Yeah. And so now the neo, and at first it was like Reagan again. It was, they listened to him, but they didn't, they had more influence now with the vice president and the defense secretary now part of the neoconservative movement. But they still didn't have as much influence as, as the, they would have liked. But then came 9 11. Now, after 9 11, Bush started listening to the more hawkish elements in in the White House, which of course now included his vice president and his defense secretary. And, and so during the eight years of the Bush of the George W. Bush administration, the neoconservatives pretty much had it their own way. And they got to carry out their foreign policy. They that the way they got to carry out American foreign policy the way they wanted, even more than when Reagan was president. Uh, and and so they really had more power then than, than they had ever had before or since. And that was pretty much the high point for them. Because, and because of neoconservative influence, we ended up going to war with Iraq like they wanted. Um, and they were in, there, of course, there was also the war in Afghanistan. But they, they hadn't really planned on going into Afghanistan. Uh, that, that was because of 9-11 and bin Laden. Now, I guess, I guess most of you probably know the, you know the war in Afghanistan. Now, I should tell you what they predicted about the war in Afghanistan. Paul Wolfowitz predicted that the vast majority of Iraqis would welcome us as liberators. <laughs> he also predicted that we could do it with only a small force. We didn't need 500,000 troops like, like Vietnam. We only needed, uh, what, it was 100, 120,000 uh, for the invasion force. We could do it with that little. Um, he also predicted that the war would cost so little that it would pay for itself from the oil revenues that we would get from Iraq. Yeah, right. That the, I'm, I'm not kidding. Now, there were people within the Bush administration who warned, no, no, wait a second, we need 500,000 troops. Yeah. And, and it's not going to be that easy. But anyway, they went ahead and did it. Now, one of the things... Now, because the, the number of troops were so few, it was essentially impossible for our military forces to control the country. And second, because... Now, the interesting thing is that... The, now, the Kurds certainly did view us as liberators. Um, they actually are very grateful that we toppled Saddam Hussein. Initially, the Shiites were as well. The the Shiites in the south, and many and many of them, or maybe even a majority of them, um, actually were did welcome uh, the U.S. forces. However, 
things started to go wrong almost immediately. For one thing, because of the neoconservative commitment to, to free enterprise and to, to laissez-faire economics, they did not make an effort to start things up again, to get things going. And this was in a country that up to that time had been a totalitarian socialist regime where the government controlled everything. So a lot of things like let, were left undone. You couldn't get, you, during the invasion, they had bombed the water supply, they bombed the power plants, so now there was no electricity, no water, and they took a long time to get that going. And one of the most amazing things in Iraq during that time is that it was virtually impossible to buy a gallon of gasoline. The gasoline was severely rationed, and this in a country that is one of the major exporters of oil. But, but, the, the, but the organization was so bad that, that, that people couldn't buy gasoline. They couldn't buy anything. You, 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 turn, you flip the switch on, there's no electricity. You know, people had to, people in, in the green zone, which was the section of, of Baghdad where the Americans lived and, and the other foreigners, in the green zone, they had to have their own power stations because you couldn't count on the power plant. But, you know, who cares if the rest of Baghdad doesn't have electricity as long as we've got our own? Yeah. And, 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 and you couldn't, and, and, and the water didn't come in a lot of times. You turn the tap, no water comes in. So people started getting fed up with this. People started saying, you know, things were better when Saddam Hussein was in power. And I watched a documentary film about this. It was made by some Iraqis who, when they started making the film, they, these, I get, I, they were actually were really happy that, that we'd come in and, and, and overthrown Saddam Hussein. But then when they saw how the whole thing, the occupation, was being mismanaged, they started to have second thoughts about the whole thing. The other thing is, is that the... Um, is that the U.S. troops, um, the U.S. troops in Iraq uh, tended to, um, they did some things that were very bad. Now, I should warn you all that this is not a politically correct speech, so, and, and, and so, so what I'm going to say, it may offend some people, but our troops in Iraq committed, a, not all of them, but a lot of our troops in Iraq committed some very serious atrocities. There were uh, massacres of civilians, unarmed civilians, who were doing nothing but you know, protesting in the street. And so the Marines responded by uh, shooting them. That happened in Fallujah in the summer of 03. There was, um, and of course, I guess I don't need to tell you about the about Abu Ghraib prison and the torture that was going on there, uh, except to say that that was just a drop in the bucket. And it was well known to the Iraqis long before the news got to us. And now, the other thing that they did that was really bad in Iraq, that the occupational people did in Iraq, is mostly an idea is, was debathification, which that term sounds a lot like denazification, which happened to a limited extent after World War II when, we, when the Allies occupied Germany. But the debathification was much more thorough. Um, because what they did was anybody that was a member of the Ba'ath Socialist Party, which was the only legal party in Iraq, anyone that was a member of that party was fired. Now, almost all government employees in Iraq, almost all civil servants in Iraq, school teachers and office workers and everybody, was a member of that party. You pretty much had to be to have your job. Well, they all got fired. No problem. The occupational authority just brought in Americans or foreigners to, uh, to do the work. And so this meant that all of a sudden, now these people, most of those Ba'ath Socialist Party members were Sunni Muslims. And this meant that you suddenly had huge numbers of people who were unemployed. Um, the other thing that they did was they also dismissed the entire army. So um, they were going to form a new army from the ground up. So they, they, so all these, all of these um, soldiers were discharged, and uh, and of course, due to the poor organization, obviously, very. I don't, I don't know if any of them got a pension or anything. So you end up with a lot of unemployed soldiers who have military skills and a lot of unemployed civil servants. In fact, it was most of it was most of the adult male population of the of the Sunni Arabs in Iraq, and. So, so they were. So, if the, if the Shiites were angry at us, the Sunnis were really mad 
And so they started, so, so they, they started leading the uprising. This is, is eventually what has led to the Islamic State of Iraq, and now that's the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, and, and uh, which effectively controls nearly all of the Sunni Arab section of Iraq now. And, and so, so the war didn't go quite according to the neoconservative predictions. And as a result, you know, public opinion in the United States changed. Americans became much more, uh, Americans had started out being mostly in favor of the war. And by about 2006 or so, most Americans were against it. And, they, and for that and other reasons, Americans took it out of the, at the ballot box, voting out the Republican majority in Congress and voting in a Democratic majority. Um, then, of course, came the 2008 election. Now, now the Republican nominee, John McCain, uh, he actually was a favorite of the neoconservatives. There's an interesting, and especially of, um, of William Crystal, the uh, son of Irving Crystal. Um, Bill Crystal was, um, was a big supporter of McCain, was an advisor to his campaign starting in 2007 when McCain first started running. And as a matter of fact, Bill Crystal was responsible for McCain choosing Sarah Palin to be his vice presidential running mate. This was another, this was another prediction of, of Bill Crystal, which he was, you know, this is that 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 she would be perfect. That she she would get him over the hump, and he'd be elected president thanks to her. Okay, I guess you all know how that went because I'm hear, hearing a lot of laughter in the audience. So they didn't win. It didn't work. And and as a result, um, uh, Barack Obama became president. That was another prediction, by the way. Bill Crystal's destroyed. Bill Crystal chose Sarah Palin to be McCain's VP in the spring of 07, and at that time he thought that Hillary Clinton would be the nominee for sure. It, it, it never occurred to him that Obama might, might end up getting the nomination instead of Hillary Clinton. So the idea, was, the idea was to prove that McCain is not sexist by, by having a woman vice president. That was the theory. It would also, it would, the, the idea also was to win over undecided women. Women who go back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans, they might vote for a Democrat because they think, oh boy, if I vote for a Democrat, it'll be the first, it'll be the first woman president of the United States. Ah, but if we got Sarah Palin, then then maybe some of those some of those women uh, swing voters will not will not go over to the Democrats. Uh, that was the theory, but it didn't work. So that brings me to the fall of the neocons. They. Uh, you know, once Obama came in, you know, I talked to Richard Pearl in 07, and he actually, he fully expected Hillary Clinton to be, um, to be the Democratic nominee, and he figured it'd either be John McCain or Hillary Clinton as president, and if it was Hillary, and he kind of was thinking it would be, that he was hoping that he and his associates could get jobs working for her. Uh, they were willing to do business with the Democrats, with a Democrat like Hillary Clinton, but not Barack Obama. And... And so they're pretty much out of power now. They were in, and now they're out. And that's the um, now, which brings me to the present and the whole situation with Iran. Now the the neo now the neo conservatives have been advocating war with Iran since right after we took over Iraq. They they look at the blackboard here. And at this point, I wish I had a, a map to show you all. But you got let's say you got let, let's say you got um, Iraq over here on the west. And you got Afghanistan over here on the east, right? And here's Iran, a big country in the middle. So it's simple. We got troops over here, and we got troops over here. So what do we do? We just invade and take over the country. Easy peasy, oh. right? Then what? Okay, so so they started advocating this in, in 03, actually even before, in, um, because, because George W. Bush had included Iran in his axis of evil, along with... Um, well, there was a good chance we would go to war with Iran as long as we did not, you know, as long as we maintain, you know, did not have diplomatic relations with them. But that just changed this year. In fact, I, you know, I started my presentation before all that stuff with Iran happened, and so I had to include it in. Um, I'll just say that, of course, as you all know, the, um, you know, this year the Obama administration began negotiations with Iran. 
um, along with several other countries, not the U.S. alone, there's other countries, other Western countries are participating in this. Um, the idea, the, 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 the goal of the Obama administration is to get Iran to commit to not develop nuclear weapons. Um, it, there has been evidence that they were working on nuclear weapons, and so that's, based, that's the idea, to get them to commit not to develop nuclear weapons. You know, you, you agree not to have nuclear weapons, and, and we lift the sanctions and restore normal relations with Iran. That's the idea. Now, now of course, Obama's having to face the Republican majority Congress, both houses, which he didn't have before this year. Um, and, uh, and the Republicans strongly oppose this, because although the neoconservatives are no longer in the executive branch, in my opinion, they actually have more influence in the Republican Party than ever, in, in terms of, at least on foreign policy issues, not so much on domestic policy, but, but on foreign policy and military issues, they have more influence than ever. They, um, the, other, the other factions of the conservative movement, libertarians and the so-called paleoconservatives, have, have little to no influence whatsoever uh, within the Republican Party. So, and so what happened? The House Speaker John Boehner invited Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to speak to a joint session of Congress, warning of the danger of negotiating with, with Iran. U.S. Senator Tom Cotton, a Republican from Arkansas, just uh, took office this year, wrote a letter to the leaders of Iran warning them that the Senate would not ratify a treaty with Iran and that a future president could nullify the treaty. Uh, by the way, um, just, just so you know, uh, for a president to nullify a treaty uh, would be a violation of international law. Once the treaty's ratified, that's it. You can only... It, so, so, now, Tom Cotton got 47 senators, all of them Republicans, to sign this letter. Uh, the, uh, now, I'll just tell you a little bit about Tom Cotton. He's kind of an up-and-coming guy. He is a protege of Bill Crystal, and he has been calling for an, and uh, Cotton has been calling for an attack on Iran for many years now. So is Crystal. By the way, Bill Crystal is currently a member of a group called the Emergency Committee for Israel, which has, which gave a lot of money to help Tom Cotton get elected first to the U.S. House of Representatives in uh, I believe it was uh, in 2012. I can't remember the year. And then and then just this last year he got they. Uh, put up the money to get him elected to the U.S. Senate. Since he was running in Arkansas, it didn't take a lot of money. Now, Bill Kristol has a history of working behind the scenes in the Republican Party and supporting what I would call populist conservatives, that is, conservative politicians who advocate Bill Kristol's positions, but who who Kristol perceives would have more popular appeal than, than he would. Um, I already mentioned Sarah Palin as an example. Another example would be his support for Dan Quayle as vice president for George Bush Sr. Um, now, now, what's significant about, there's something different though, about what the neoconservatives are saying now. It's different from how they acted before. Even though they're warning that Iran is only months away from building a nuclear bomb, I'm not exaggerating, they're saying it's only months away, okay? Uh, for the most part, the neoconservatives are not advocating preemptive warfare this time. They're not advocating preemptive war with Iran anymore, as they did with Iraq. Um, and, be and because of what happened in the Iraq war, the idea of preemptive war is far less popular today than it was 12 years ago. And now at this point, I just wanted to say, and this, this isn't on, this isn't on my, on my script, but I, um, I want to say, actually, I mentioned having met Richard Pryor. I actually have a personal connection to the neoconservative movement. I used to be one. Yeah, yeah. Now you guys didn't know me then, but when I was in graduate school, when I was in graduate school, I was a neoconservative. You are forgiven. Okay, so I actually, so so all of this stuff I'm telling you, is stuff, all of this stuff that I'm telling you is stuff that I used to believe. Now, let me tell you how I became, now, 
Now, I've got to warn you, this is not a politically correct lecture, so I'll just tell you how I became a neoconservative. Basically, when I was growing up as a kid, I, my parents were liberal Democrats, and, and, and I kind of went along with all that. And, and, um, and it, in high school, I met a kid who was a libertarian. This was like the Reagan era, and, and I was impressed with, you know, I, I kind of felt like, I mean, my parents were liberal Democrats, but in the Reagan era, I kind of felt like li liberalism had failed, you know? It, they, they tried, it didn't work out. And, and so, so I was sort of attracted to, but there were things about the regular conservatives I didn't like. Like, they're, like for one thing, I'm not religious, and the, the, the regular conservatives make it out that, oh, if you're, if you're not a safe, baptized, born-again Christian, you're going to hell, you know. And so, you know, I didn't care for that. And so, so I like the libertarians because they're not out to, they, they're different from the liberals, and they, and, and they, you know, and, and, and the things, uh, the, the areas that I agreed with on the, Repub for, on the Republican side, I also, the Libertarians believed in, like, free enterprise. But at the same time, they didn't want, they were not out to legislate morality, like, the, like, like most of the conservatives are. Actually, actually the whole conservative movement, but I didn't, didn't realize that at the time. Um, and, and so, so I was, um, so I was real, well, not the whole conservative movement. I would say that the, but anyway, mo most of the conservative movement was out to legislate morality. So I was kind of, I, I became drawn to libertarianism. But I kind of moved away from libertarianism to some extent because, because I realized that over time that there are some things, that there are some government functions that are necessary. You can't just get rid of all of it. And uh, I was still kind of, still trying to, de so, so I decided there's some government programs are a good thing. And then I um, um, I went to graduate school. I'd gone to college in the 80s, and then in the 90s I went to graduate school. And I went to the Claremont Graduate School in Claremont, California, which, by the way, the Claremont Graduate School, had the, the Claremont Colleges have a lot of neoconservatives. In fact, there's a think tank there in Claremont called the Claremont Institute. And I've met the head of the Claremont Institute, Brian Kennedy. I've had, had lunch with him several times. And um, how did I get into the neoconservative movement in, in graduate school? When I got there, I was a history major. I was studying history. And, um, and I was always hearing this stuff about how white men are guilty. This is the 90s. And this is always because the, that history department, the, the, the Claremont Graduate Schools, well, well, there might have been a lot of neoconservatives. There's a variety of opinion. But the, the history department at the Claremont Graduate School was actually controlled by leftists. And so I was always hearing this stuff. Uh, about 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 how bad white people are, and, and and all about people of color. And then I was hearing stuff about how bad men are. Women are good, men are bad. Non-whites are blacks and Hispanics. People of color are good, white people are bad. And I got fed up with it. I got fed up with with hearing all the time that I'm bad just because I'm a white man. I got fed up with that. And 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 I also I was also against affirmative action. And this goes back to to, to my days as a libertarian when I also opposed affirmative action. It always seemed unfair to me because I felt well it, the, the the standard should be the, to my, to my first of all. And I always thought of it. I didn't. I always thought of it in racial terms. I have to admit that. And and I and and, and it always seemed unfair. Why should a person? Why should a black or Hispanic person get preference over me? That's not fair. That's not what Martin Luther King fought for. And, and, and so I was certain that if Martin Luther King were alive today, he'd oppose affirmative action. I was sure of that. And, and so... Killed by a white guy. What? Yeah, killed by a white guy. So, well, that, that's beside the point. <laughs> anyway, anyway, there's... So what... So... So I hate to admit this, but I guess it was largely for racial reasons that I sort of became more attracted to the neoconservatives. What I found was that the neoconservatives consisted almost entirely of white guys like myself. Okay, resentful white guys, and there were almost there were there were no 
there were there were there were no black or his. There was a group of students that hung around. There was a professor named Harold Rude who was one of my favorite professors. There were other profs too. But he was one of my favorite professors. He was a really nice guy, uh, and I really enjoyed his classes. He was a very good teacher, but he was an arch conservative, and and. And, and, and all the students who hung around with him were almost entirely white, white guys. Okay? There were, there were no, no non-white, no Asians, no blacks, no Hispanics, and almost none. There was, there was the one woman hung out with him. She was, uh, she was, from, che she was from Czechoslovakia, and, and, uh, and, and, and since, since she was the only woman there, I dated her. But that's... <laughs> And, and so, so well, there weren't any other women. So what other choice did I have? So yeah. So uh, I anyway. But I, I felt much more com much more at home with them because they wouldn't they wouldn't blame me for being a man or blame me for being white or call, say that I'm the oppressor because I was hearing it even from other white people that were politically on the left. Oh, you're you're one of the oppressors. They'd say, a liberal white person. I got fed up with that crap. And so, so what, over time though, I came to realize that, that the, the neoconservatives were more, were, were more that, that, that they had views that I didn't like, that I didn't agree with. First of all, first of all, they, uh, when I met with Brian Kennedy, he was talking about how to impeach Clinton. He was sure, and I didn't think Clinton was, I kind of like to tell people jokes about Clinton, but I didn't, but I thought they were completely nuts because, about this Clinton business, because they were talking about how Bill Clinton had, had murdered Vincent Foster, this guy who officially had committed suicide, but really, really we know he was murdered by Vincent Foster, uh, excuse me, Vince, Bill Clinton murdered Vincent Foster, and we're going to get him for this, we'll impeach him. And, and I thought, this is nuts. And, well, Brian Kennedy came off like a, just a fanatic to me. I didn't like him. But, uh, but Professor Root and the other students seemed to like him, and they seemed to agree with him, which bothered me more. The other thing is I came to realize that Professor Root himself uh, had some views that I found reprehensible. Now, i got to tell you that in spite of my resentment over you know, being blamed for being a white man, uh, I never considered myself a racist. Never. Never at any time did I think I was a racist. Uh, but I gradually found out, that, now this was right at the end of the apartheid era in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was about to become president. And the attitude among most of my fellow neoconservatives was that this would be a disaster for South Africa, allowing black people to vote. I'm not kidding. They thought, the, the basic attitude was this, and you may, this goes back to the Moynihan Report, Gene Kirkpatrick's writing about third world countries. But the basic attitude was that these black, the black Africans just don't have the, 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 the skills and knowledge and wherewithal to be good citizens. They need to have that government controlling them. If, if the government doesn't control them, then, then, uh, then the country will just go to hell in a handbasket. <clears throat> I'm not kidding. That was what everybody thought that except me. Everybody said that except me. Now they would never say such a thing in public. I'm saying everybody, every neoconservative at that time thought that except for me. It was it was a it was a unanimous view. No, no one would argue with. And that really bothered me too. And I started to, well, you know, eventually I got a job out of California and I moved to Tennessee. Moved back in with my folks, and and, um, and and then I kind of fell out of contact with them. But even before that, I began to realize um, I began to realize that that although the neoconservatives pretend not to be racist, really they are. And 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 I I couldn't you know I couldn't deal with that. And I, I also began to understand better where a lot of the resentment comes from from uh, from the left. I think it's wrong for people on the left to to blame white men for everything. Because if you're a working class white man, you don't have a lot of power, you know. But but if but at the same time, I understand where that resentment comes from, and and, and I understand why people why why people why why women would feel that way about men, 
and 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 white people who aren't white who live in this country might feel would feel that way about white people. Um, you know, a lot of people don't like it when I talk about these kind of things, racial issues and stuff like this. Um, a lot of times, you know, I have to be in a lecture setting like this because if I talk about this in conversation, the first thing people want to do is they want to shut me up, and they don't want to hear it. And and so, so what happened? So anyway, I got away from the neoconservative movement, and and something else happened. And starting in 1996, I um, I began voting Democratic. And oh, no. yeah. oh. So, oh. So, oh boy. So anyway, so I had some more stuff written here. I went off on a, a. You know, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into all that. But let me just talk briefly about the, what might lie in store for the future of the neoconservative oh. movement. Um, they're out of power. I, you know, the title of this lecture was The Rise and Fall of the Neoconservatives. Um, and that's the theme that I built it around. So what's, what's the future for the neoconservative movement? I think, I mean, they're out of power now mainly because a Democrat is president, and at this point they wouldn't work with, they wouldn't work with a Democrat, at least not a Democrat like Obama. They might work with Hillary Clinton, but not, not him. And, and, however, what I've observed, especially in the last few months, is that the current people who are in Congress now, they're not 100% neoconservative, but on, on issues of foreign policy and military policy, they seem to agree with the neoconservatives about 100%. And this amazes me when you consider how many times these neoconservative so-called pundits have gotten it wrong. They were wrong about they were wrong about communism. They were wrong about the Cold War. They were wrong about the Iraq War. And they were wrong about Sarah Palin. <laughs> and but 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 it, it never wears off. They the the Republican leadership, by the way, the entire Republican leadership in the Senate and the House of Representatives, the entire Republican leadership of the Senate signed Tom Cotton's letter, okay? okay? All of them. The only person who had influence that didn't was the senator from Tennessee, Bob Corker. <laughs> the only one. Who, who He's the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So, so I think that, so right now they, right now the Republicans control the, both houses of Congress now, if we get a Republican president in 2016, um, who's it going to be? My money is actually on Jeb Bush. And now, Jeb Bush, as I mentioned, was a member of the Project for a New American Century. So, which, by the way, George W. Bush never was. So this means Jeb is actually even more committed to the neoconservative uh, agenda than George W. was. So if, so if he becomes president, um, I think we're probably going to see a return to the neoconservative policies, uh, at least on foreign policy and, and the military. But it's, but more so. And I guess that's all I have to say, so I guess we'll, uh, let's move on to the question and answer session.
come about. Um, how does that affect the foreign policy of the neocons? The fact that you know, if you you know, with this unilateral unilateral hawkish position, now there's a mess. At least three countries, and I'm probably missing one. Okay, you were referring to the so-called Arab Spring. Is that right? Right. The dictators mm -hmm. that have been toppled. All right. First of all. First of all, I don't agree that what replaced the dictators was anarchy. It, at least not, maybe in the case of Libya, um, the government there has very little control. Um, in the case of Tunisia, I mean, it's been a mixed bag. Okay, well, in the case of, well, Tunisia was the, always considered the first country in the Arab Spring. In the case of Tunisia, uh, they did have a democratic government, they had elections, and things are going smoothly there. Now, uh, in the case of Egypt, they had a democrat, they had elections, um, and as uh, the, uh, uh, a candidate from the Muslim Brotherhood um, was elected president, and soon after he was overthrown in a coup d'état by the military. Uh, in the case of Li Libya, it's just been total chaos and anarchy, as you say. Uh, as for how this affects the neoconservatives, I have found something that I believe I've searched for things that the neoconservatives have in common with other conservatives, with the other, with the rest of the conservative movement. And I know this might upset some people who they consider themselves conservative. But one of the things that I have found that they have in common is, is being impervious to reason and experience. <laughs> and therefore, I do not believe, given the history of the neoconservatives and ignoring, ignoring their mistakes of the past, or, and actually not learning from them since they ignored them, and given their... Given their, also their, um, their, you know, the fact that they weren't involved in any of this, uh, I don't think it's going to affect them in, at all. I don't think it's going to change their mind about anything. Okay, uh, okay, who's got another que question? Okay, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, uh, could you, uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, sure. The first part is, can you tell us, uh, about the project for New American Century, what mm -hmm. document are they most famous for? And two, the signatories of that document, where do they go after George and Dick were installed in the White House? Well, a lot of them went right into the White House, as you know. I think you probably already know that. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember the name of the document. Um, you know, like I said, I had to do this in a hurry because of the problems in my personal life. And, and so I don't have that information here with me. I have, and, and the bad part of it is I actually read the document cover to cover, and I and I still don't have the name of it down here on my on my report. Well, it, it was something like securing would, America's future. But yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. They yeah. called for a new Pearl Harbor. Well, no, no, they didn't call for it. That that's 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 a misunderstanding. They didn't call for it. What they said is. That, that it was unlikely, they could. I, they thought they could try to implement their ideas incrementally, but it was unlikely they would be able to implement the whole kit and caboodle short of some disaster like a new Pearl Harbor. And advocate, that's not the same thing as advocating a new Pearl Harbor. So, um, so, so I would I would make that distinction there. Okay, um, okay. Who, who else has a question? Uh, right, right. Okay, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is a question. Kind of, maybe you two things. One is uh, basically the, the, the people that make up the Tea Party yeah. mm -hmm. uh, across this country. I, I have a feeling uh, there's a lot of probably neoconservatives in there. And, and this group seems to be opposing Obamacare very vehemently. Uh, they're trying to undo it all the time. Is, is this the work of the neoconservatives? No. The, the Tea Party is a different phenomenon. Like I said, there's more than one kind of conservative. Now, now the Tea Party and... The, the Tea Party is essentially a conservative populist movement. I know it gets funding from rich guys like the Koch brothers, but so does every political group in the United States gets funding from some rich person. Even the Revolutionary Communist Party uh, goes around soliciting rich people to give them money because if you want to raise money in America, that's how you do it. Yeah. Ah, true. And and so, so there's. Uh, but the Tea Party is a is a genuine. The Tea Party is a genuine. Um, it 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 originally it's pretty much it is a grassroots 
phenomenon. It has, they have local chapters all over the country. Um, so so there is there is grassroots as pretty much any any group you could name. Now, the the neoconservatives are a very small group of of intellectuals and high level government employees. Um, there's a little joke that there are actually more neoconservative magazines and journals than there are neoconservatives. So they are not a mass phenomenon. They, they typically do not run people for public office. They find a guy who's running for public office that they can get behind and that, that they like. Okay. What about Obamacare? Though? Okay, Obamacare. Um, Neo, um, I just say in, in that in principle, uh, the neoconservative movement has not does not oppose a social safety net in principle. In practice, it's more of a mixed bag where some some oppose it and some don't. They oppose some programs, not others, or they want to reform some programs and not get rid of others. But the, generally, the neoconservatives today are more interested in foreign policy. William Crystal um, is he's a Republican all the way. He opposes the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Oh, Who else has got Charlie a question? Paydock. Okay, Char Charlie, go ahead. Sean. Get a guy over there. All right, Sean. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I think, uh, well, one of the things I, I felt was not brought up, mm -hmm. which I think is probably the most critical things that happened in Iraq. Yes. And the neoconservative movement. Yes. Was the role, you know, you brought up Fallujah and Abu Ghraib. What was behind that, more than our military, was actually private contractors. And then, whether it's just that or also, you know, like the Iraqis when they came in, like, hey, they're going to rebuild this. And then we came in there with like, oh, no, we'll do this. This will be this perfect example of how we can do the laissez-faire free market system. And we'll bring in all these private contracts, and all they did was steal. Mm -hmm. It was so, a thievery. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so what's your question? It's not my question. It's something I felt was critical that was not brought up. And I think it's fundamental to, in some ways, the mixed bag. I think, in some ways, they did achieve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we have a we have a rebuttal period uh, after the Q and A, and and then you Sorry. can come up here and no, 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 so no let, me, let me let me finish. You can come up here and 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 say your piece. Then uh, that would be a time to do that. Uh, okay. Who? Uh, do no, no, no problem. Conservatives have a position about using private contractors versus the military. What is their position? Do they believe it's just our military, or do they advocate the use of private? Contractors? All right. Donald Rumsfeld strongly advocated the use of private contractors as a as allegedly a way to save money. Uh, one of the things that he did. Let me finish. Let me finish. One of the things that he did when he took office before 9-11 was he cut way back on the Defense Department. I know that sounds counterintuitive because you think, oh, Republicans, oh, they spend more on, on the military. Not Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld actually reduced the military, and he got a lot of people in the military actually very angry at him for doing that. He made a lot of enemies in, in the defense. Um, but, and he was doing this before 9-11. Then, when we got into the war in Afghanistan, Rumsfeld... Uh, tried to, he he tried to, to to win the war with spending a minimum of money, uh, only send in a very small number of troops and let the Afghan, uh, let the Afghan rebels, the Northern Alliance, do do most of the fighting, and we would just mainly provide air support and and some advisors in the form of the Green Berets. Uh, so, uh, as a matter of fact. In, in 2002, when I was still had a subscription to Foreign Affairs magazine, I read an article uh, by Donald Rumsfeld about this. And, 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 and believe it or not, guys, I mean, I hate to say this, but even as late as 2002, this is two years after I started coming to this place, I still was an admirer of Donald Rumsfeld. I'm not kidding. Oh, my God. And, and, uh, and, and so, so I really agreed with Rumsfeld at the time. I thought, oh, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. Brilliant strategy. It, it took me a while to realize that this this was not going to work, and so so that was so the, so yes. In terms of uh, Rumsfeld himself was very much in favor of the use of private contractors. Mm -hmm. um, in general, there there is a you know they they do tend to prefer. Obviously, the the neoconservatives prefer capitalism to socialism. Uh, of course, then so do most Americans. And they and and they tend to lean more in the direction of wanting, you know, wanting private enterprise and taking the view that that anything anything government can do, the private sector can do better. 
And and there's a little bit, now I wouldn't call that laissez-faire capitalism, be, not if it's a government contract. That may be what they call it, but that doesn't fit the classical, you know, libertarian definition of, of, la of laissez-faire capitalism. Now, the other thing that I would say about this is that there is, well, actually, I completely forgot what I was going to say. Let's go to the next question. Uh, All right. Right. Oh, yeah, what's this thing that the president doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the foreign affairs of the United States? I never said that. Yeah, you said something he, like Congress the does treaties, and if he doesn't go along with it, he's in violation of international law. For treaties, Charlie, you're out of context. Oh, uh, Charlie, what, I'm talking, uh, what are you referring to specifically? You, if you could tell you me what... What's in that? You said the president... Regarding treaties, which I thought were always treated like any other piece of legislation, mm -hmm. and then you're saying the president. The, okay. No, no, no. That's not. That's what I thought too until today, Charlie. I was doing a little research on on the the controversy over Iran, and I found out that according to international law, if 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 a treaty is signed and then a president. A, a, a president of the United States then nullifies it. Um, well, it could be the existing president, but I don't think Obama will do that. Uh, anyway, if a president of the United States then nullifies the treaty, that violation of the treaty would be considered a violation of international law. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, and I can and and I can I can give you my I can give you my sources offline yeah, if you want. Go on. There's no such thing. As, you don't nullify a treaty. No, 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 let me just say that the treaty, any treaty that, that the president signs has to be ratified by the United States Senate, okay? So, so there is, you know, there is some participation of the legislative branch of government in this. It's not just the president acting on his own. Okay, uh, who else has a question? Right here. Tim Mulder. Go uh, ahead, Tim. Don, given your expertise in the neoconservative movement, yeah. how we went wrong in Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Would you, what would be a recommended solution and how to untangle ourselves from this mess? Or do we stick around? Can you please give me your thoughts on this? Okay. Now, so what you're asking me is... Uh, how do we get out of is, Iraq is, and is, Afghanistan okay. and solve the problem? All right, get out. Okay, well, you're assuming that we should get... You're, you're assuming that we should get out, you're quite, by the way you phrased your question. Well, just, all right, how about I rephrase it? How do we solve the problem of Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, that's a good question. The answer is I don't know. I don't have all the answers. You know, my... my uh, I, I just want to say that my lecture tonight was meant to be... Mm -hmm. Descriptive, not so much prescriptive. Okay. I don't have, I, I don't have answers. Um, I mean, I don't have, a, I don't have the answers to the world's problems. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get up here and bullshit everybody and say that that I have all the answers when I don't. All right. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I say it's an excellent presentation, and you put a lot of things together. Very good. Yeah. Elaborate a little bit on PNAC, mm -hmm. rebuilding America's defenses in 1997. They said the project had to be enforced using the U.S. military. Yes. And in order to get the people behind it to follow it, they would need some catalyzing event like uh, a new Pearl Harbor. They didn't advocate a new Pearl Harbor. Look, I've read that. Like that. <laughs> no, they didn't add. They did not advocate that, and they didn't even say it was necessary. They said it was unlike. I read the document. They said it was unlikely that they could. That they could try to get their. They could try to get their. Meet their goals incrementally, which is how you usually have to do it in a democratic government. But that it was unlikely that they could get all of it implemented unless there was some catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. This is the question you asked. Is the same one that Andy asked me right. earlier. And but I read. Elaborate. They said it would galvanize the American people. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's right. But they didn't. That's right. But they didn't advocate that. They didn't say it was necessary. Well, they said they couldn't. They couldn't get all of their agenda passed at once yeah. without it. Uh, but they did think they could get. They could get parts of their agenda passed, and they were somewhat successful during the Clinton era because, because we did expand NATO to the east, which was one of the goals of the PNAC. 
we, we, we brought Poland and, and, and the Czech Republic and Slovakia and some other countries into NATO, moving, moving the frontiers of NATO eastward. Okay, and then they, now they took control of the government January 2001, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld, even mm -hmm. PNAC people, eight months later, 9-11. Now isn't that the, the most amazing coincidence you ever heard? Yes, it is. No, it isn't, because <laughs> as soon as I heard about 9-11, right away, I figured bin Laden was behind it. I've been following the news about bin Laden since 1994. Let me tell you something. Now, I wasn't planning to talk about 9-11, but, <laughs> but I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Operation Botinka. Have anybody heard of that? Okay, I got a few. Hand your hands right up. Okay, all right. This was, some of you may recall that, uh, that back in 1993, that uh, a group of, um, a group of, of Muslim radicals bombed the World Trade Center. Yeah. Blew up the garage. Yeah, they, they were not successful in bringing down the Twin Towers, but they tried. And, and so, they didn't, most of those guys were rounded up and arrested. But one of them got away. And if I remember correctly, that one guy's name was Ramzi Yusuf. Yes. He went to the Philippines and hooked up with some other uh, members of what we can now call Al Qaeda. These were these were Islamists who were getting money from Osama bin Laden. Now, in about 1994-95, the house they were living in got raided by the Philippine police, and they seized their personal computers. And they found on the computer something incredible. A plan. This was 20 years ago, and I heard about it in the news when it happened. It, it, it was a plan to, to hijack multiple airplanes at the same time and fly them into uh, famous buildings. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? So this has been... Now, at this time, today there's... Um, today the... You know, in, in the 2000s, after 9/11, the, the the American news media was was not allowed to 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 broadcast speeches by Bin Laden. The um, uh, but but in the 1990s they did. They translated from Arabic to English, of course, and and at that time, Bin Laden came on TV and he talked about why he had declared war on the United States. <laughs> And he said, he, he said it was because, because of our true presence on the Arabian Peninsula, profaning the sacred soil of the land of the two holy cities, the, that is, the, the, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, the holiest cities in Islam. And, and therefore, he would, he would wage war against, against the, the infidels until we, they withdrew their troops from Arabia. Now, he said this in the mid-1990s. So, I know what you're getting at. You're, you're, claiming, that, um, you're claiming that George Bush caused 9-11. No. I don't. Let me tell you something. Given how competent these guys were, if they tried to blow the World Trade Center up, it would still be standing. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead, ma'am. Who was head of security uh, during the first uh, attempt to blow it up? I... I don't remember. I can tell you. George Bush's brother. That's right. Jeb Bush. No, it wasn't Jeb. But it was his brother, and he quit one week to the day. You're talking in 1993. Yeah, the first one. He had all the plans for the World Trade Center. Yes. And then he went in the insurance business. That's right. And he sold the policy to Silverstein. Who's Silverstein? He's the one that bought it from the... Uh, the owner of the World Trade yep. Center. Yeah. He owned it for six months yep. before... It Magically blew up. Yeah. Magically blew up. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> it's a trilling, as they say. Okay, well, that's interesting. Sure. Yeah. And we're running out of time. We're going to have to get a rebuttal period. But my question is, is uh, are the neocons, to what extent are their, their foreign policies 
uh, derived from or in agreement with uh, Likud and uh, uh, Bibi Net Netanyahu. Okay, that's, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Brom. Look, one of the common criticisms of the neoconservative movement, uh, especially from their counterparts, uh, uh, the paleoconservatives, is is that uh, is that basically the the reason they're so pro-Israel is because so many of them are Jewish. Well, uh, and and that yeah, a lot of the neoconservatives, especially the early people that joined the movement, were Jewish, and. Oh, you mean And I think, personally, I don't want to see Israel get blown off the map, okay? I mean, so in the, to the sense that I think Israel has a right to exist, I'm pro-Israel too. I never, I've never been anti-Israel. Um, but I think there's a difference between being pro-Israel and believing that that the Israeli Defense Forces have have the right to shoot unarmed Palestinians uh, because be, be, because they might have picked up paving stones to throw at them. And building settlements. Yeah, and there's there's also well yeah that's the other big issue is the is the the settlements of course, um, and there's a difference between being you know supporting the Israel's right to exist and supporting Israel's right to uh, to to build. Uh, settlements in occupied territory that does not, by international law, belong to Israel. So, so that, so now the neoconservatives like to, they like to do this thing where they say that where where anyone who criticizes Israel's policies, like anyone who says that Israel's being too hard on the Palestinians or anyone who says that the building the settlements is wrong, is anti-Israel. And if you're anti-Israel, you're anti-Semitic. Uh, it's a lot of bunk. It's not true. And um, now, oh, that's the, uh, yeah, I've heard, yeah, that, I've heard that one too. So, so I, I think that we need to separate, so you mentioned Lee Koo in your question. Now we need to separate out now, it's true that the interesting thing, here's an interesting thing about the neoconservatives in, in the U.S. Congress and the Likud party in Israel. They get their money from the same people. For example, one of the biggest funders of Likud is an American um, named Sheldon Adelson. Uh, and uh, also, the, um, he also gives a lot of money to the Republican Party here in this country. Now, obviously, I think, he, I think he's an honest person. He believes, I don't agree with his politics. I think he's an honest person who believes in what he's doing. I think he's giving money because I think he believes he's doing what's best for Israel. And I think he, he's, he's Jewish and he cares about Israel. And I think he's also doing what he thinks is best for his country, the United States. Um, but to a great extent, one has to ask, rather than how much is... How much is the Republican Party manipulated by Likud? How much is Likud manipulated by the Republican Party? <laughs> All right, who's got another question? Hey, how about rebuttals? What about rebuttals? Yeah, we got to go to rebuttals. Yeah. Did you yeah. want to yeah. answer the questions and go to rebuttals or, or well, what, Brown? Uh, five minutes after eight. Uh, I think it's going to rebuttals. We want to stay. <laughs> oh, well. Um, yes. We've got, yes. We've got a Janet's got her hand up. She hasn't asked. And 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 and, 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 and Carl here, he didn't get to ask a question. Let's get these last. Why don't we let Janet and Carl ask their questions? Oh. Yeah, like All right. There. There. <laughs> Karina asked a question before. Sorry, Karina, but I think we need to let someone go. Yeah. Well, it's affirmative action. Okay. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Janet. Um. Do neoconservatives refer to themselves as neoconservatives? Uh, you missed the beginning of my lecture, Janet. Frequently yeah. they don't. No. Uh, some of them do. Yeah. But, but also, who are they specifically today? <laughs> Name the early ones. Well, okay, uh, you, uh, missed, you, missed my, you missed the first part of my lecture, Janet. I'll just tell you who... Okay. Uh, the, I'll tell you who the major players in the movement uh, have been in the past. It was, in the past, it was Norman Pod Horitz, yes. Irving Crystal, and Jean Kirkpatrick. Right, and that. now, in the present day, uh, Irving Crystal died, and his son William Crystal is, is yeah. has taken over, and and he's kind of 
he's obviously very prominent and he's everywhere. Gene Kirkpatrick died. Norman Podhoritz is still around and he still publishes commentary. So, so he's still around. One guy who's very prominent now is um, Charles Krauthammer. He's a writer, a pundit. Um, and he was right. <laughs> yeah. You didn't have to say right, it just right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, so let's go. What about Carl? You had a question. Last question. Yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. Oh. Um, you've mentioned money affecting the, the, the process several times now. Yeah. Do you think that there's too much money in politics and it should it be uh, limited? Okay, that's a good question. And, um, you know, as with, as with Tim's, that's a question concerning domestic politics, and as with Tim's question about Iraq, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I have all the answers. I don't, I don't know. Look, the, the money in politics thing is, is an issue because, uh, because you can end up with a country, if people put enough money in, you can end up with a country that appears to be a democracy, but really all the politicians are bought and paid for. And, and so rather than representing the people who elected them, instead of representing their constituents, they may well end up really representing their clients, their financial backers, who may not even live in the United States. Yeah. I mean, just, just as an example, right here in the city of Chicago, our parking meters are not our parking meters anymore. They now belong to a company that is headquartered in, I believe it is Spain. Oh. Okay? Oh. So this is this is an example. Oh. Not only is it not a Chicago company, it's not even an American company. Oh. And and in the state of Indiana, you have another a foreign company that that controls the Indiana toll road. I used to live in Indiana, so. No longer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They would, oh, I heard about that. Yeah, but you know, that goes to another issue which you could spend a whole, to, a whole college of complexes evening on, and the subject of whether public transportation, including toll roads, can ever be made cost effective and run, you know, actually run for profit. Uh, my argument is that it cannot. Um, and so, so, yeah, it's a serious problem. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, you know, back in my libertarian days, I thought I had the answer for everything because all I had to do was open up, open up a book by Murray Rothbard, and there was the answer. <laughs> but okay. once I drifted away from libertarianism, I no longer pretend to have all the answers. Okay. 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 Um, Let's thank our speaker. We don't have presentations to make to the rest of us. Let's the thank our speaker first. <laughs> First, I want to congratulate Don again for another really good, well-prepared presentation. This brings us to the fundamental question of what was the United States doing and what does it need to do? Needless to say, we are the dominant world power today. Like it or not, we are an empire. I think we are an accidental empire, but we are nonetheless. There are two things that I think the United States simply needs to do to keep itself and the world out of war. The first is to keep the goods aflowing and the second is to keep the sea lanes open. You can easily remember this. You keep the goods of flowing and the sea lanes open. The United States' major export around the world today is security. Security of the sea lanes, security of the high seas, security of the air routes, maintenance of a lot of the infrastructure that would be taken over by somebody else 
if we didn't do this, and there's a lot of costs associated with this, the UN, the other agencies involved, and the respect we have for other uh, intergovernmental organizations is paramount. However, we don't need to go into foreign countries, tell them how to live and how to govern. The biggest influence that most people forget today as to why the world is going democratic and we're seeing a little bit of a spread of a peaceable movement is because of the spread of information technologies like the internet and the, and the plausibility and spread of globalization. I will, however, sound a warning. In 1910, there were several books written in Great Britain on how, because the world at that time was so globalized, that we would never have another major power war. How wrong we were. And it was almost 70 years before the doors swung open again on globalization. I think we're much better off when we're talking to each other, when we're trading goods back and forth, and we're seeing the benefits of free trade, fair and free trade. I would hate to see us not exercise these prerogatives to keep and maintain some semblance of world peace. We're not the world's policemen, but in a sense, we become that de facto because we are the largest power in the world. I'm only going to say this once. We do not need to spread our culture, impose our values on other cultures, because eventually, with the rise of globalization, the rise of living standards, and the benefits of capitalism and free trade, that this will extend to the other countries. Thomas P.M. Barnett, who wrote a book called The Pentagon's New Map, put it this way. When a country connects with the global operating system, it prospers. When it doesn't connect with the global operating system, it doesn't. He talks about, I could go on and on about this forever, but look up on the web, Thomas P.M. Barnett, his goals of global strategy. Look up again to a forecast for the next hundred years by a gentleman. Anyway, I'll give you the references offline. Why don't you look up Bangladesh clothing industry? Charlie, I'll tell you what. Bangladesh clothing industry. They're, they're connected, yeah. right? They're connected, and guess what's happening? Oh. Reform. <laughs> Reform's happening. Workers' rights. Almost exactly what happened here in 1910, right after the Triangle Shirt Fire. That's where globalization happens. If you didn't have it, you'd see it a lot more. Thank God we have that global media. Thank God we have this stuff. And thank God it's finally some of this injustices are going. But if Bangladesh did not have those clothing countries, they'd all be great, glorious peasant farmers that Mao likes. And guess what? They all leave for the cities as soon as they can. That was a great uh, talk that he gave. All right. So thank you, Don, wherever you are. <clears throat> I have a, a few comments. One, I think that Don made uh, too many distinctions between um, the components of our ruling class. Um, I think essentially that, uh, for instance, the Obama administration and the Clinton faction of the Democratic Party, those people are essentially neocons anyway. Uh, the war on terror has gone seamlessly, pretty much, from the Bush administration into the Obama administration. Uh, what has Obama done? Invaded uh, Libya, uh, escalated the war in Afghanistan as soon as he got into office, uh, stayed in, a, uh, in Iraq for a long time, went back to Iraq recently to fight quote-unquote ISIS, whatever the heck that thing is, which is you know, very likely largely an American creation anyway. <clears throat> so. Our own class is a lot more monolithic than I think Don um, appreciates. Another thing that Don said is that uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney uh, didn't have much influence in the administration, the Bush administration, until 9-11. I completely disagree with that statement. Um, I think that 
when Bush was elected in 2000, he brought in a whole lot of those neocons, and Cheney and, and Rumsfeld in particular were primary architects of 9-11, along with many other neocons in the Bush administration. They created and, and, and carried out 9-11, and they're uh, guilty of mass murder and uh, against Americans, number one, and then carrying on this uh, uh, fallacious war on terror to the rest of the world and killing millions more people. Um, I'm currently reading a book on <coughs> uh, what the U.S. did in Afghanistan, excuse me, Iraq, Blood on Our Hands by Nicholas Davies. It's an excellent book. And what the U.S. did in, in Iraq is beyond the pale. It's like uh, a genocide. It's, it's, it's right up there with the, with the Nazi Holocaust. It's, it's uh, unbelievable. And our media and much of the public just glosses over that, like it was some innocent mistake. That's complete bullshit. Um, so, another thing, um, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was not mentioned only in uh, PNAC's Rebuilding America's uh, Defenses. Donald Rumsfeld uh, mentioned the need for something like a Pearl Harbor in his commission on uh, expanding the uh, military into space, which is a, a big um, a project of his and the other neocons. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who used to be Carter's uh, 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 advisor, security advisor, <clears throat> mentioned the need for something like a Pearl Harbor. They used those words, Pearl Harbor. And they kept on talking about a, uh, the need for a catalyzing event to launch this quote unquote war on terror. So the whole, uh, the 9 11 and the whole war on terror was an American creation. And it's, um, it's just hor horrendous, of course. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that Obama bin Laden was behind 9 11. Oh. And, that's correct. And the FBI, the FBI itself, says that in plain English. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever. Yeah, I saw on TV like you and I. So anyway, uh, that's about uh, most of what I had to say. Um, and thank you. <laughs> Next. Open microphone. Next speaker. Hey, you should have given us a plug in here. <laughs> Let's sit down and we'll line them up. Yeah, yeah I'm, uh, where, where's uh, Duff? Don did a mellow, beautiful job. Yes. In fact, I'm glad I'm down here tonight yeah, because boy, maybe I can get something from that, but I don't think I have the makeup to do what he does. Yeah. For instance, I'm old enough to be his daddy. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't heard and read some of that that you talked about, but I don't have what it takes to put it all together. Because when I read the newspaper today, and the article is interested, I read that, I understand it, but I throw it away. Ten years from now, I can't put it together like that. So, so Don, you are a king when it comes to that. Yeah. Now, he mentioned Foster and uh, was killed by Kennedy, somebody mentioned, but I heard a different story. I heard that Kennedy saw Foster coming out of Hillary's room, what? and he said to Foster, he said, Foster, I saw you. I don't want no more of that. <coughs> and Foster said, me either. <laughs> 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 so, so, uh, <laughs> oh, now, it's, it, it, it's a, a, a far as, uh, uh, for instance, in, in that, uh, I'm sure y'all you, you read that. But from now, I forget all of that. Uh, the legislature passed a law that if you went in a drugstore and you were with your husband and you happened to be a man, the drugstore could say, get out of my face, get out of my face, I ain't gonna do it. Now, people, let me tell you. Now, who would come up with something like that if it wasn't directed at the masses? Other words, your so-called leaders and so-called whatever it is, divide and conquer is give what gives them po uh, power. Ignorance, what gives them power. Uh, uh, fear, that gives them power. People, if you believe these people down there in the uh, legislation in, in Anna is using some kind of intelligence and some kind of honesty because they personally can defend their position on one or two women getting married and a man getting married. Now, they don't want to do that with that. 
they find any other things that they can find for the sole purpose of dividing the masses. If any government is worried about anything, they worry about the millions of people that they got to keep controlling. Somebody uh, 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 Don said that, that you tell the public a lie because if you told them the truth, they wouldn't understand it and they wouldn't accept that. So when things come up, like uh, in Indiana, when things come up when, when uh, like religion, for instance, who do you think grabbed a hold to that if it wasn't for president, kings, and queens and heads of state? Why did they grab, grab a hold to that? It don't take no genius to, to, to uh, grab a hold to some fiction. They grabbed a hold to that so they could use that to divide. Now, if you look at Christianity, how many different sects we got in Christianity? Ain't no unity there 100%. If you go to other religions that come from the same sources, for instance, Islam uh, recognized Christ, uh, Christianity, and, 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 and the Jews uh, recognized Christianity. In fact, the founder, Jesus, was a Jew. So people, listen, think about, oh, and I got to uh, thank Don again. It, when you talked about the, you used to be and so forth and so on? Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> great people have said the same thing, and I love them for that, I love you. Ain't nothing like defending yourself by doing your own thinking. And when you do your own thinking, you walk away from the bullshit, that's what he did. <laughs> now, yeah. uh, right, <clears throat> and the other one that came out in the speech was that he reads some books and not find people. He got a master degree. It must have been worth something. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Don't hold back, though. Don't hold back. Because I'm talking to those who don't mean, know me, I got to say. At any rate, uh, I just, uh, Don gave a very good expose and uh, neoconservatism, I didn't know exactly by that name. Oh, you know you are. Going back in time, uh, you know, one of the things he said was that Kennedy launched the uh, attack on Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, it was a total disaster. Actually, uh, my recollection is that it really, the planning for it started under Eisenhower in his last oh. days in office with the CIA. And when Kennedy took <laughs> office in 1961, uh, they told them that the, the plans had been laid uh, basically for this attack invasion and uh, it was too late to really change it so he just went ahead with it. Of course, it was a disaster at the time that he was in office so, you know, he's uh, buttonholed uh, with the uh, being uh, responsible for the uh, collapse or the failure of the invasion by the CIA. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind, and Don didn't address this, was uh, 1952 after the war. Uh, we had the big uh, Red Scare, uh, Eugene Washington, uh, head of the uh, Un American activities in the Senate. You know, everyone was getting blacklisted and uh, brought to Washington and questioned and everything. Uh, and uh, Woody Allen did a movie on it called The Front. Uh, you know, uh, the thing is, is that um, I don't know if he was considered a neoconservative, but uh, he certainly caused a lot of waves and grief among the people. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, Don didn't cover that kind of affected me in, in observing, you know, the reports on the uh, war in uh, Iraq uh, was that uh, you know Dick Cheney I think was on the board of Halliburton and that war went up for a long time and I'm sure Halliburton made millions of dollars from the long effect of that war I don't know how much money exactly you know us American people had a foot so that Halliburton and Cheney could make profits from that war but it seemed like it was in their interest uh, to have a prolonged war. Uh, the other thing is that, that I remember uh, after the first Gulf War, you know, where Kuwait was liberated by the U.S. and then uh, they they went after got um, Saddam 
Hussein out of uh, Kuwait and uh, Bush was thinking about attacking Baghdad at the time, the country. But a lot of people warned Bush uh, that uh, he would create a power vacuum if he invaded Iraq and got rid of Saddam Hussein. So in wisdom, he uh, listened to his uh, counselors, advisors. But uh, Bush II, uh, or 43 as they like to call him, uh, went ahead into that country and, and created a vacuum. And, you know, uh, of course, you know, in the beginning there were a lot of the people that wanted to take over that country were more than glad to see the Americans there. And then, you know, we had Al-Qaeda and now we got ISIS uh, as a problem in that country. So uh, it was, the advisors were right that there was a power vacuum. And unfortunately, Colin Powell, uh, played into all this because they, you know, he was convinced that uh, there were weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq and uh, there was some justification uh, for it even though it wasn't totally proven to go invade Iraq and unfortunately, you know, that set the stage for everything else that followed and uh, well that's about it, thank you. Uh, thanks, Don. Uh, pretty good presentation. Um, you, you didn't quite put the light all the way in the corners on a couple things, so I will uh, attempt to do that here. Um, let me get my notes. Yeah. You know, don't leave any out. Thanks, up. <laughs> I wore my Bob Matter hat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I like your hat, Charles. Uh, first of all, I want to start with a, a, a good definition, a good simple definition of neoconservative, and that is a liberal who's been mugged by reality. <laughs> they used to say, you know, conservative is, uh, is a liberal who's been mugged, and a neoconservative <laughs> is a liberal who's been mugged by reality. Uh, and Leo Strauss is really the heart and soul of neoconservatism. He is the you know, the, the Messiah, uh, who wrote a book in, uh, I believe, I don't know, 1941 or 52 or something, and that really was the catalyst for the movement. Then with, then Irving Kristol, and I think there's another guy where the, they call them the godfathers of neoconservatism. Pod Horitz. Based on, based on, uh, on Strauss's writings. Uh, and what, you know, uh, there's, People, people like to, uh, they, they kind of confuse, you know, libertarianism and conservatism and neoconservatism. Uh, neoconservatives uh, are, their, their biggest fear is nihilism. Okay, they're, that's really what they're afraid of. And they're, so they're really, uh, you know, so they're, they're really big on, you know, America maintaining, a, you know, a moral position. They want people to to go to church and to, to be, they want the, the focus is on the community, not the individual. That's the big difference between uh, libertarians and neoconservatives. Neoconservatives want people to sacrifice, uh, you know, their own uh, goods and happiness and everything for the better uh, betterment of the community and then the betterment of the state. They want you to fight for the state, to live for the state, and ultimately to die for the state. Uh, they believe in censorship, you know, they think that, uh, you know, that all these things like, uh, uh, you know, pornography, uh, gambling, other vices, uh, you know, drug use, they think those things all lead us into this moral abyss to the, the big fear of nihilism. Uh, and that's one reason why they are not big proponents of laissez-faire capitalism. They are for free enterprise, but they're very suspicious of laissez-faire capitalism because of the tendency of laissez-faire to, you know, reach out into all these other areas, into these areas of vices, really, not crime so much, but vices, like, you know, prostitution and, and things like that. Um, so that's, uh, so that's that. Uh, so the, the big difference is uh, the separate the two. 
Um, you know, now this business about be, you know moralists being pro-war. I mean, the the neocons want to project American power. They want to make a world better for you know the American country, the American people. So that's why they kind of advocate you know preemptive war and going to war. They they want and there, there's a, there's roots of this is that most of them are, are Jewish, and most of them witnessed the Holocaust. And they realized that, you know, before World War II started, here was this tyrant, Hitler, uh, coming to power, and everybody could see it, and they saw what he was, you know, what he was up to with, uh, with the genocide of the Jews, the Holocaust, and everything. And so that stuck with them, and they think that it is better to go after a tyrant in the early years than to wait for it to manifest itself into another, you know, genocide or something like that. So that's why they are, uh, you know, such advocates of, uh, you know, things like preemptive strikes, and taking down di dictators and, and nation building. Uh, they figure it'll be, you know, it'll be a safer, better world for Americans. Again, they put the state first. Uh, if the world is free of tyrants and, and dictators and totalitarianism. So. Uh, and I sort of uh, believe a little bit of some of that to some extent, even though I am more or less a geo libertarian. Uh, oh, the other thing that libertarians, of course, are the pure libertarians tend to, you know, they don't want unnecessary interventionism. You know, they only want to, you know, fight for fight if 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 we're attacked or something like that. They don't believe in you know like you know preemptive military. Uh, extravaganzas and things like that. Uh, I am out of time. Uh, I guess I'll have to, uh, I'll probably have to give a speech on why uh, the Iraq War was necessary, just like I gave one on why uh, uh, the uh, Vietnam War was necessary uh, for you guys. Uh, 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 Okay. Good evening. Again, uh, that was an excellent presentation. I really learned a lot from it. I'd like to point out that Hitler went after my people first. Remember, uh, Martin E. Miller said in Germany, first they came for the communists, then they came for the trade unionists. So they were after my people first. So the Jews, you got to take a back seat. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the guy that planned the 20 planes, that was a, a Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and uh, he was going to crash or uh, into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, well, you know, you don't know for sure. This uh, information is passed around. But he wanted to crash 20 planes at the same time. What I think happened was he only had... At this time, he only had four pilots trained. And I think the Bush administration came in and said, okay, we'll go with your four pilots. I went, <laughs> and one of them wasn't even that good. <laughs> I worked for NSA for a while. One of my jobs was to gameplay attacking the United States. And I uh, saw the defenses up and down the border. There's no way a plane can get near the Pentagon. I'll tell you that. So when a plane hit the Pentagon, I knew right then, that's an inside job. And um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was, uh, got his engineering degree at the University of North Carolina here in the United States. The pilots got their uh, flying lessons here in the United States. Some of them got them from uh, training <coughs> schools owned by the Walker family, George Walker Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. Stratasec had the security contract at the uh, World Trade Center. One of the top executives was a guy named Martin Bush, the youngest brother of George Bush. So they had the way to get into the, uh, to put uh, nanothermite in those buildings. But, uh, I, I just wanted to say, Don, from the founding of this country until 1965, we had affirmative action. 
it was for you and me. <laughs> Just I mean, after that, we had to share it. So I went through the same thing. <clears throat> I got all the breaks. I was born in 1940, so by by 65, when we got equal rights. Well, I was already launched on my career, and um, that's about all I have to say. Thanks very much again. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Don. Um, it was like watching a movie over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, my name is Raj Patel, and uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Obama for Cuba and now Iran. I think he showed a great courage, and uh, I, I hope he showed more courage. Obama was selected. Obama was a Jewish choice. They didn't like the Clinton, so they, they were the first to early finance when he was in trouble. He wasn't getting money, so they deserve it. I, I have talked more Jewish people in Israel over the last three months than I have talked to any other people any time in my life, except local people. It's, it's, a, it's a amazing how much, how much they are focused on their fears. How much, how much, I mean, it, it, it's just like a paranoia, it's a different world. We cannot imagine even. Okay? And, and, and they, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in America even, when you watch TV, they control all the TV. The news, which are not favorable to them, don't come easily. The, the Israeli minister said on a, when every single party was represented on a TV show in Israel during election, that all the Arabs will be killed. I, I like to kill all the Arabs. Do you know? There was no, not much news in America, except very slightly mentioned. It is America, it is our fault. It is time that we should call Bar Mitzvah on Israel. Say it is time to grow up. It is time to take your own responsibility for your own affairs. It is for you to go out and be an equal partner in the world and deal with other countries. You have the you have the brains, you have a great country, you got a great knowledge. You got a great organization. It is, please, give us a break and let parents go. And if you have a problem with Iran, there is a telephone. And if you do not, you can call Iran. If you cannot find a telephone, you cannot do it. Tell America that please, you know, get us a meeting. You can do it. You know, Egypt, Egypt's president did it to Israel. Same thing, nothing else can do it. I mean, and let, let us be realistic, I mean. You cannot keep people. I used to have a good Jewish friend. My last meeting before he died in, in New York City. When I came here, he said, every time I go to New York City, he said, please call me up and we go for breakfast. And he said, do you know what bothers me? is that we cannot keep these people like this forever. Do you know? It is, it is a cancer on a, on a what you call it, and a soul of Israel. And that will eat you away. And it will haunt you. And it will, it is American Jews, Jewish responsibility to rise up and convince Israel that give Palestinian their freedom. If you do not do that, it will hound you and you will have a really, really difficult time. You cannot, you, know, you cannot have a majority of Europe, Europe on the street hating you. Majority of the Middle East hating you. And majority of the people knowing that, hey, this is a bad news. 
please get over it and get it done because this is a very bad. You are good people, you are smart people, you are bright people. Israeli should be Israel should be the Hong Kong of the world. We should be leading Arabs. And you should be making a that area so prosperous that it is the best area, prosperous area in the world. Aristides Prokopiou Yanibas, my name. I was born south of Athens, north of Sparta, in a Greek hillbilly like Appalachian. But uh, if you're looking to find in me a Greek god, I will, I'm afraid you will be disappointed. Like I was. Like this young man said, 1956, when I went to college out in Iowa. One guy, John, in my dormitory, he got up in the 500 uh, uh, people there in the audience at the college, and he said, this guy, Harris Yanabas, he comes here from Greece. Actually, I was there 10 years after I arrived on the boat from Greece. 46, I came on the boat at 8 years old, 18, I was in college in Iowa. And he says, we expected to see a Greek god, but all we saw was a goddamn Greek. <laughs> <laughs> This is the words, not of a Greek god or an American god, but a goddamn Greek. And one thing about us Greeks, we're a bunch of hillbillies. And the hills and the mountains is the last, uh, what do you call it, asylum, the last sanctuary of freedom. Because in the Greek mountains they say, in the plains they breed horses. In the mountains, they breed heroes. Uh, 75 years I've been trying to be a hero, but I never made it. Uh, I've been 55 years I've tried to make it into the middle class. I still haven't made it. Even though I got two college degrees, I'm still struggling to pay my bills. So this is reality. You know, the difference between the dream and reality, the American dream of milk and money. Well, I drink a lot of milk, but I never learned how to make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> My good friend here, Don, is always stimulating, and I'm sorry prior commitments is the blame that I, used, that I didn't get to hear him because I was so fascinated to hear his talk on, uh, It'll be on the rise and fall of the neoconservative. But uh, I wanted to take issue with my friend Don for two things is uh, <coughs> the rise and fall. Well. And that's the first thing, it never fell. It arise, it rose, uh, actually it was, it came here on the Mayflower. Neoconservatism was all, and after that, the, with the slave owners who made the Constitution, the swindlers, the speculators, and throughout the whole history, America has never been a great nation. It has the potential to become a great nation, it has a uh, rich in natural resources, wealth, in human resources, with all kinds of brilliant and energetic people who are not allowed to really contribute their full share to the American uh, experiment for racial reasons or other reasons, financial reasons. But uh, it does have the potential to become a great nation, and that, my dear friends, is up to us. It's not. We can't blame our predecessors. We can't blame our descendants. So we got to start sometime, and I think the time is to start now and to start here. But now the second part of um, Don's word here, neoconservatives. Well, uh, these guys, Don, are not neoconservatives. They are neo-Nazis. <laughs> See, uh, in this uh, intellectual audience, I don't have to give you the difference between con uh, Nazis and conservatives. Conservative is a relatively respectable term. You know, in the British Parliament, you've got the conservatives. In the U.S. and other countries, there are the conservatives. But these guys, they started World War III, and just like Hitler burned the Reichstag and blamed it on some drunk communists, 
to kill 27 million Russians, including me. I almost died in World War II. I'm a survivor of the Holocaust. But George Bush II, he uh, killed 3,000 people in New York in order to launch uh, the Nazi World War III. And it's not a failed uh, campaign, it's a successful campaign. They have destroyed civilizations that were there 5,000 years in Iraq. They've destroyed the most popular and the most respected government of 48 nations in Africa, 45 nations in Africa. So it's a success, it's not a failure. And they're going to keep going until they exterminate maybe two or three billion people more. I kind of agree with them, but they're not that evil. All right, Ted Aranda is going to be here May 16th to go over this 9-11 issue again. And hopefully we'll resolve it, so i give you a little advertisement there. Let's thank our speaker, who's really good. Now, you say you went prepared, I'm certain it was a good tonight. I think I'm going to go off script a little bit. Um, I personally don't keep up on the political directions as assiduously as Don does, but I will talk about this area of treaties that he talked about. Uh, which raised my attention. I spent a lot of years as a member of the United Nations Association, still am. Unfortunately, we don't have an active chapter here. But the particular concern, and one of the areas that people don't get pay much attention to, is the area of treaties, which is a type of federal legislation, which is enacted by the Congress and signed by the President. And of course, these are generally uh, initiated through the executive office of the presidency. I think there's 2,300 pieces of legislation at any given time in the U.S. Congress, and about 300, I think about three or four, maybe a few more, are treaties that are in various stages of progress. There's been some interest about changing relations with Cuba, and many people are not aware of this, but there have been 50 treaties signed with Cuba. And as a matter of fact, Cuba is regarded as one of the better countries in terms of honoring and complying with the treaties that they do make. They're not by any means a rogue nation. And certainly one that, that tells you misguided foreign policy of the United States that we have isolationists against a country that basically behaves itself and once it puts its eyes to deal, it sticks to it. Um, the, the thing you, Don was talking there, I don't think if a nation violates a treaty that the president's put in trial and brought before the International Criminal Court. I don't think that's what happens, but, um, you know, and uh, the other thing is uh, guys like my friend Bob here, the free, and this other guy, my pal Tom, or um, Jim, <laughs> is that they, they disdain treaties because these interfere with the free commerce. I and the other thing, you know, like the World Trade Organization, not, they, they don't want any treaties at all because they want anything goes and so that you can go in and find a, poor, a country and go in there and exploit the population to make stuff for you and you can put a yoke on them and get them to work, you know, making money for you or something like that. So they generally disdain any treaty. And the one that's really kicking out, of course, is the EPP, the Trans-Pacific one. I've also heard something here about the United States should be an isolationist nation uh, and forget the community of the world at large, perhaps even. And there's no argument that isolationism is not a simpler course. I have no argument that I, our isolation is better than intervention. Intervention means complication. But I'll tell you one thing, if I was president of the United States, I'd be a statesman. And I'd go out and I'd end the war, the war, in every war that I could find, I would make an effort 
to put an end to it. That's what this nation should do. And this nation, I heard something here that we should not be a peacekeeping nation. Well, then what kind of nation should we be, sir? I'm not a Christian by any means, but it is Holy Week. And didn't the leader of the Christians say, blessed are the peacemakers or something? Or theirs will be the kingdom of heaven? All right. Go out there, and if I had an army, I would not use it for these renegade adventures here of, cons of controlling oil, but use it for the purpose of bringing in peace, the drink peace, of getting rid of bad guys. And the best way you that know, can be done is with the propagation no, of the it doesn't mean sending in capitalist bad guys to replace them. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> that was pretty good. I, I don't really think that perhaps there's differences of opinion with the neoconservatives. There's other things out there in the community of Things. They, they, they don't sound like they're perhaps misguided. I have a difference of opinion with the neoconservatives. I don't know if there's some evil conspiracy or cabal. But um, they're out there. You have to deal with them. But anyhow, thanks a lot, Don. It was really good. Yeah. Take care and have happy holidays. I even have one joke about rabbits. All right. Mike Blame. <laughs> uh, a couple things that didn't come up tonight. Um, just real briefly, one was uh, when we went into the uh, Halliburton thing. Um, you know, I think America, we've become what Eisenhower uh, warned us about. We're a military industrial complex. We're, we're into war for profit and, and industry. And I think the ne neoconservatives are big on that. There's a lot of money to be made in wars. And it's kind of funny how well, these Mideast wars uh, concern oil countries and oil regions. <clears throat> so, if anybody wants to learn more about this, uh, the HalliburtonWatch.org site is still up, and Iraq War and Oil Wars were planned long, long ago, and it's been all planned out. And yes, Mr. Cheney was involved big time. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was that the the message of the neoconservatives has been so strong. Ever since the 80s, um, that's when the Fairness Doctrine was uh, knocked down, where, where all medias had to show um, both points of view in a political uh, context. And, um, you know, the neoconservatives and the conservatives and Republicans are very clever. They're smart, smart people. And they pretty much took over the medias, and it's very evident in right-wing radio. They pretty much marched to the tune of the, the Limbaugh's, the Levines, the, the, the a lot of the uh, right-wing um, Savage, yeah. And, and 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 it's just been so strong, and uh, the liberals and the Democrats just don't have that big presence in the media. Although the Republicans say that the media is all. You know, liberal, but uh, but yeah, the, the conservatives are very clever, very clever, and so they pretty much took over the uh, right wing radio after the fairness doctrine uh, went sideways. So it's too bad that that's out. Uh, that was 1987 that happened. That's about it. Just the media thing and the oil wars. Tonight is the uh, second night of uh, Pesach, uh, of Passover, uh, in which uh, uh, Jews and, and those who uh, remember, uh, remember that people who were oppressed in Egypt were liberated. They had to combine, they had to move, they had to liberate themselves, but they had people who, cons who though they weren't Jews in the sense of being brought up in the Jewish households, 
but Moses, Moses who had become something of a Midianite because he had to escape uh, from uh, Egypt, but who had been brought up uh, in the household of Pharaoh and uh, Pharaoh's daughter's uh, household. Well, he provided leadership because he saw how people suffered and how they they needed their traditions, the traditions of uh, a somewhat nomadic existence, uh, in which they they looked out for each other, and he um, led them out. Um, back to the uh, promised land of their ancestors, uh, hoping that they uh, would learn the kind of solidarity, the kind of kindness uh, that uh, their ancestors had known, and uh, that this would make them uh, God's people. Because God is kind. God, the Lord and giver of life, wants us to live, to live abundantly. And uh, that's why uh, Jesus uh, says he came. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, and he is willing to die for that. Uh, he was willing to give his own life uh, and to risk the lives of those who followed him uh, in, in that effort, but he didn't kill anybody, nor did he arm his uh, disciples, except maybe they could have a couple of swords uh, for show purposes. Just for show. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah just for show. maybe <laughs> intimidate those who would abuse the weak, the un <laughs> unprotected. Well, anyway, we remember with these people, we hope that uh, we in our pilgrimage, uh, unlike the uh, uh, people who want to make wars and um, look at, um, in a self-righteous way, uh, on others and, uh, and it, I, I just hope. Five minutes. Time's up. All right. I'm Time's sorry up. If I, I, uh, Time's I up. Time's up. Uh, this... Time's up. Yeah. Really? Is it up? Yes. yes. Okay. Amen. He has risen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Anybody else? Don, wrap it up. Don. Wrap it up, Don. Okay, Don. Wrap it up, Don. Thank you for your thoughts. All right. Yeah, that was <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, a real good uh, remarks um, on, in the rebuttals. Um, first of all, uh, Doug, you uh, were talking about Canada. Yeah, it's true that the Bay of Pigs invasion was planned uh, while Eisenhower was still president. Uh, however, Kennedy did carry it out, and so uh, he does bear responsibility for that. But that, the Bay of Pigs invasion, you notice I didn't mention the Bay of Pigs invasion in my, in specifically. And there's a reason why I didn't mention it specifically, because it was only the beginning of the United States' attempts to overthrow Castro. You see, that's the one everybody remembers, that's the one in the history books, but... Um, as a matter of fact, and it's just to get back to what I actually wrote, I wrote he tried to overthrow the Castro government in Cuba. Okay, the Bay of Pigs was was the first attempt.
to overthrow the Castro's government. But then they initiated Operation Mongoose, which yeah. was which was an attempt to assassinate Fidel. Uh, they made multiple attempts. A friend yeah. of mine says that there were actually several hundred. All obviously, all of them failed because he's still alive. Yeah. So um, yeah, and now. Cigar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the odds of him being killed by those cigars were greater than the odds of him being assassinated. It seems. All right. Now on the subject of Dick Cheney, uh, uh, Cheney wasn't just on the board at Halliburton. He was actually the head of it uh, during the 1990s. Um, um, while Clinton was president, um, uh, Cheney was you know he wasn't no longer defense secretary, but he was so he became the head of Halliburton, which is actually a pretty good job for a former defense secretary to be the to be the head of a, of a major military contractor, a construction company. Uh, when he quit that job, when, when George W. Bush uh, chose him to be his vice presidential running mate. Now, uh, the war in Iraq today is not uh, what the war is. That, let me just make a distinction here because it's really two wars. You have the U.S. Invade, you have the US conquest of Iraq in 2003. And then you have the resistance war by by against the U.S. and its and and and, and the U.S. backed Iraqi government uh, by the rebels starting uh, not long after that. So let's say um, now that came about not as a result of a vacuum. Um, it actually came about as I said as a result of an armed uprising uh, uh, by the Arabs against the U.S. and Iraqi government. Uh, this is still continuing today in the form of ISIS. Now, the, that, Bob, that quote you made uh, about, a, neo about a, a neoconservative being a liberal who got mugged by reality, that is a quote from Irving Kristol. Yeah, he was the first one to say that. Now, now it is what you were saying about the neoconservatives. It is true. Now, well, okay, some of the neoconservatives are not unanimous on these, these social issues like church going. Uh, most of them are actually non-religious. And, um, and, and as I said before, many of them are Jewish. Uh, however, there is a view among certain neoconservatives that people should go to church and that the U.S. government should encourage people to go to church, that it's good for them, that it's good for their souls, or not so much because that's the only way they're going to go to heaven, because most of these guys are atheists. They don't believe in heaven. But, but because they believe that in the no, what I talk, the Straussian noble lie, that that ordinary people are not intelligent enough to have any kind of intelligent understanding of right and wrong unless it's given to them by their religion. And therefore, uh, therefore, they should be encouraged by their government. The, the government should have a religion, and it should encourage or maybe even require people to follow it uh, so that people will have some incentive, some reason to do good. You know? And basically, that well, intelligent, educated people can read classical philosophy and, and have some moral sense of right and wrong outside of religion. Ordinary people are incapable of this. That's that's the basic argument. That's uh, true. And so now on the vice issues, the neoconservatives are not unanimous. Um, as I said, there have been you know there are neoconservatives who who consider who or find homosexuality highly offensive. Um, like I believe uh, Midge Decker, for example. And, and obviously there, are other, there have been other neoconservatives who actually were gay. Like, um, like I mentioned David Brock used to be a neoconservative and also um, Andrew Sullivan. They're not in the movement anymore. A lot of people that used to be neoconservatives are not anymore. Uh, me, uh, Dave Brock, Andrew Sullivan, Francis Fukuyama left the movement as well. Um, and, <laughs> but now, the other, as for I don't for, to forget who it was that said something about how most neocons witnessed the Holocaust. It's not precisely true. Um, I don't know of any neoconservatives who were actual Holocaust survivors. Of course, uh, Leo Strauss, I don't know if you count him as a neoconservative or not, but if you, even if you do, he actually he got out of Nazi Germany in the 30s before things started to get really bad. They lived through that period. Yeah. Uh, now, now, yes, they lived through that period. Irving mean, Crystal lived through that period, but he was here in the United States when all, and Norman Pot Morris, they were here in the United States when all that was going on. So it's not exactly the same as being trapped in Auschwitz. Um, and, but it certainly did influence their thinking. One of the things that neoconservatives uh, do a lot, which, which I didn't mention because of time limitations, is they tend, 
they tend to cite Munich as a lesson for foreign policy. I don't know how many of you understand that, but basically if you go back to 1938 and Nazi Germany, Hitler had just taken over Austria, and now he was, <clears throat> he was demanding the predominantly German section of Czechoslovakia, which was called Sudetenland. And, and so the, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, uh, went to negotiate. He said, well, you can't take that over. This is this would be a violation of the, of the Versailles Treaty. So he went to negotiate with Hitler, and eventually they worked out a deal where Hitler would take, um, Hitler, Hitler was allowed to, to take over the Sudetenland, and, and in exchange, Hitler promised that he wouldn't make any more territorial demands. Well, when he took over the Sudetenland, he decided he actually wanted all of Czechoslovakia, so he took the whole country. And, and now, at the time, Churchill, Winston Churchill, who was not yet prime minister, criticized Chamberlain's conduct, said that, that you know, that, and Churchill, by the way, is a big hero among the neoconservatives. And, and so, so basically the argument is that is that we need to treat every enemy like it's Hitler. We do not negotiate with enemies because if you negotiate, if you give them an inch, they'll take a whole yard. Yeah. And so you can't, you can't make any concessions to them or give them anything. No that's right. No appeasement. That's the term they use. Appeasement. No appeasement. Exactly. That's, that's right, Bob. So uh, that's, that's the argument. Now, <clears throat> Okay, uh, Raj, you wow. called, um, is Raj still here? Yeah. Okay, Raj, you yeah. called Barack Obama the Jewish choice. That's, that's a generalization. Yeah, there were Jews who supported Barack Obama for president, but there were Jews who supported John McCain. Mm -hmm. And in the primaries, there were Jews who supported Hillary Clinton. Not primaries, very early when he didn't have the money. They give the initial money. Yeah, but you, you. Yeah, but the way you said it. And, and by the way, this is my turn to speak. The way you said it. Uh, the, 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 way you, the way you said it is. It makes it sound. It, it, it makes it sound like like all the Jews supported Barack Obama. No, everybody understood. Well, well, no, 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 Raj, uh, you had your chance. Okay. All right. Now, Charlie. Now, Charlie, about the um, you you were talking about treaties now. The way treaties work, it's not, uh, the treaty has to be, I want to just repeat, the, a treaty is, is normally agreed on between, between the executive branch of government, of our government, and, and, and the foreign power, and then, and then they sign it, and then it has to be ratified by the U.S. Senate for it to become the law of the land here in this yeah. country. That's, that's how the system works. Now, we have had U.S. presidents who have violated international law. In, 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 for example, George W. Bush. Actually, so has Barack Obama, but that's another topic uh, for another lecture. Uh, thus far, no president has been tried by the International Criminal Court, and I don't believe that, that any U.S. president or high government official in the U.S. is going to be tried by the ICC anytime soon. Um, nevertheless, that does not change the fact that they're unlikely, by the way, the Israeli government has violated international law uh, seven different ways from Sunday, uh, but it's unlikely that any of them are going to be tried by the International Criminal Court. The fact that somebody does not get prosecuted does not take away from the fact that they broke the law. Now, the neoconservatives are usually accused of being the war, the war criminals. Well, yeah, well, uh, war criminals, actually, I've he heard them called war mongers more often because they're usually on the sidelines advocating for war. Okay, now, now, Charlie, I would have to say the same thing to you as I said to Raj, okay? Now, Mike, okay. All right. Now, now, the other thing I would say, now, Mike, Mike you were talking about uh, Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh and the other talk radio guys as neoconservatives. I wouldn't classify them as neoconservatives. I think the neoconservatives tend to have a very strong intellectual orientation. And um, actually, I had an argument with Brad about this on the way over. Uh, I maintain that, that Rush Limbaugh and, uh, and, and the, most of the other, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, uh, and most of the other people in right-wing radio and, and broadcasting, are they are not... They agree substantially with the neoconservatives on, on a lot of issues, uh, especially on war and foreign policy, but they are not neoconservatives. They're what I would call conservative populists. They're broadcasting their message to the masses. And along, uh, and, and along with it, it, they put out this idea that, that, that the common people, we represent the common people, Bill O'Reilly especially does this, we represent the common people against the wicked elite, which is liberals. 
and and so so this is this is conservative populism, and it's actually anti-intellectual. Uh, they they tend to uh, if they talk if they talk about intellectuals at all, they tend to uh, this this type of conservatism tends to depict intellectuals as as you know liberal elitists, effete snobs, pointy-headed intellectuals. That's what George Wallace called them. So this is this is a very different phenomenon from neoconservatism, and I'm getting a signal here from from Tim that it's time for me to ramp up the program. And in any case, since I have nothing more to say, I will conclude for tonight. Good to see you. 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 Good to see